why don't we get going? Um, I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's meeting of January 18th, 2023. Um, today we have a presentation, presentations by two national experts in rural health systems and rural health hospital finance. As you know, all of you know, there's a lot of bright spots in our healthcare system here in Vermont that we should be proud of, but we're also experiencing some significant challenges in connection with affordability and access, and our healthcare system is seeing signs of financial difficulty. Um, many rural health systems across the country are experiencing similar challenges, and the board, together with AHS, is working on understanding these issues through our work on Act 167, which was passed last summer. And today, the board has asked two esteemed experts on rural health systems to present so that we can understand some of the national trends um, and contextualize what we're seeing here in Vermont and hear about strategies that have been implemented or could be implemented here in Vermont. Um, Dr. Mark Holmes uh, is from the University of North Carolina, and he's the director of the SHEPS Center for Health Services Research and has been since August of 2016. Uh, he's a professor and associate chair for research in the Department of Health Policy and Management in the Gilling School of Global Public Health. And he has a PhD from the Department of Economics at UNC Chapel Hill. And his work focuses on hospital finance, rural health, workforce, health policy, and patient-centered outcomes research. He's been recognized with uh, numerous awards, including a Rising Star Award and 40 Under 40 Awards. Uh, we also have with us today Eric Schell, who is the chairman of Stroudwater Associates, uh, a national healthcare consulting firm that works with rural and community hospitals, health systems, and large physician practices. Uh, Mr. Schell has experiencing work we, working with hospitals throughout the country, including here in Vermont. His area of focus includes assisting rural hospitals, rural health clinics, and phys physician groups to improve financial and operational performance and develop strategic and operational plans. He is a featured speaker at rural health conferences uh, across the country and speaks to issues including critical access hospital financial and reimbursement issues. Um, I'd like to thank them both for being here today and sharing their expertise and experiences. We also will be hearing today from an equally impressive expert that we have right here in our own state, uh, Sarah Kinsler. She's especially local for those of us here at the board, given that she's our director of health systems policy. And we're blessed to be able to pick her brain and speak with her at any given moment. Ms. Kinsler has a master's in public health from the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. And she is going to provide an update today on the board's work in connection with Act 167. Um, and with that, I'll turn it to Ms. Susan Barrett for the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to announce that yesterday uh, the board submitted its 2022 annual report to the legislature. Um, thank you to the board members, the staff, um, who all, everybody contributed to that report. Um, it is located on our website under what's new. Uh, it's also been submitted, as I said, to the legislature. And if anyone has any questions regarding the report, please reach out to us. I also want to uh, share the ongoing public comment that period that we have regarding the next potential all-payer model between CMMI and the state of Vermont. As I've shared uh, previously, the uh, next potential model will be um, is being negotiated and led by the Agency of Human Services and the Governor's Office, and we are accepting any comments that the public has on uh, this potential model. We share all of those comments with our partners at the Governor's Office and AHS. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you very much. Um, we'll take up the board minutes from January 11th, 2023. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from January 11, 2023? So moved. Second. Second. Is there any board discussion? All right, those in favor of approval of the minutes from January 11th, 2023, please say aye. 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 And the vote is unanimous and the minutes are approved. Um, before we get to our speakers today, um, I wanted to acknowledge that members of the House Health Committee uh, are here today. 
And I want to thank them for their work and leadership in this space and for their attendance. Um, from time to time, we do have members of our legislature attend. Um, today, I know they'll be in attendance. I want to thank them for that. I also saw uh, at least one staff member from our federal congressional delegation. I want to thank them for being here as well. We additionally have a number of tomorrow's leaders here with us. Um, members Holmes and Lunge. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting some feedback. So if everyone could just mute. Uh, members Holmes and Lunge teach a January term uh, class on health, law, policy, and economics at Middlebury College, and a number of their students are with us today. So I want to thank them for attending. Um, I'm sure you all have many opportunities once you leave Bucolic Middlebury, and I hope that you'll consider staying here in Vermont in careers in public service. Um, they're extremely challenging uh, careers and work, but it's extremely rewarding. So thank you all for coming and um, learning from members Holmes and Lunge, something I do often and um, we're, we're glad that you're here. Um, and really briefly, I want to discuss the open meeting law. I've been receiving a number of questions about what it is and why the board has um, all of its meetings uh, on camera or in public. Um, Vermont has an open meeting law, uh, which requires that all meetings of public bodies be open to the public. Uh, the statute has some particular definitions as to what qualifies as a meeting, and there are some exceptions, and if you're interested in those, you can find them at 1 VSA section 310 through section 314. Um, but in, in short, when a quorum of the board gathers uh, to conduct board business, we must invite the public and conduct that business in public. And so that's why even informational board meetings such as this one uh, are carried out in, in public. It's one of the unique features of the board and how we do our work and the public input in this process is very important. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to our presenters. Great, thank you, Chair Foster. Should I just go ahead and, and start and uh, jump right in? Okay, great. Um, and let's see if I can get to the right window. There we go. Uh, go back to the window. So um, I'll do that thing where I ask, oh, hopefully everyone can see it, but someone will yell if you don't see a screen that says Rural Hospitals Financial Health, a national perspective. So um, I'm delighted to be here today, um, and I'm uh, prepared to speak for about 25, 30 minutes, um, and uh, happy to take questions uh, at the end, uh, subject to the um, uh, to, to the chairman. So um, if you are like me and have a short attention span, um, trying to give you the uh, the gestalt right up front, the presentation in one slide here. Um, so I'll spend about the first half really talking about the state of hospital finances nationally, um, giving the perspective of national trends um, and what rural hospitals have looked like over the past decade with a lot of focus in the last uh, couple of years. Um, and really trying, uh, spending some time separating um, the, the notion that CARES was really valuable for hospital support, um, but it can lead to somewhat misleading conclusions based on, on those data and, and the importance of really understanding what you're looking at um, in terms of hospital finances during this uh, CARES era. And then the last three bullets are all talking about sort of um, uh, trends overall in, in, the, in the hospital industry, uh, pivoting away from outpatient focus, uh, pivot to outpatient focus facilities away from inpatient as a, um, uh, as a primary book of business, uh, talking a little bit about mergers and the pluses and minuses of those, and then spending a little bit of time on the rural emergency hospital as a representative model that, um, uh, the feds and others have tried to look at to look at in terms of uh, recognizing this this trend. Uh, here's my um, slide where I pretend to be a lawyer, but the first bullet basically says thank you to the federal government so for providing the um, uh, resources to do this kind of work. I have no conflicts to report. My focus generally will be a concentric circle kind of idea, national um, hospitals overall, rural national, looking at the Northeast uh, in terms of the U.S. Census Bureau definition. So that's from Pennsylvania uh, up um, and using those as different as different uh, benchmarks. Um, and I'm, most of the data here are really drawn from the Medicare cost reports. These are publicly available data that every hospital has to submit. They're non-audited and, um, you know, uh, 
you can have a lot of different definitions of what each of these terms that I'm using means. Uh, but basically, they're pretty good data. They're almost certainly going to differ from anything else that you use if you're using a different data source. But the general takeaway should be there. Um, so when I say the operating margin is 4.21% and you get 4.18% using a different data source, we're going to declare victory on that. Uh, but we're over. We're looking at overall trends, not just uh, not really um, uh, focusing on the definitions such as what does rural mean, for example. All right, so let's jump right in. So if you uh, search for rural hospitals or hospital profitability in the last couple of years, you'll see a lot of coverage that says record profits and hospitals are doing great. Um, and um, that cares and the, the, the fact of the matter is that cares money and the pandemic support really offset, uh, for lack of a better term, a cratering and operating margin. And I think everyone on, here on this call understands um, and so it's important to separate total margin from operating margin. There's all kinds of different definitions that we can use, uh, but let's, we're going to denote patient margin as a very specific type of operating margin. It really is only um, patient care. And so in particular, what we're really worried, interested in with patient margin in this definition is it shouldn't have any of the um, CARES money in it. So here is the trend in margin uh, that we can look at for the pre-pandemic. So the two vertical lines here are March 1st, 2020, and a year later, uh, we have different definitions of when the pandemic was really hitting. I was at the CDC, I think, on March 2nd or, um, of 2020, and it was a very surreal event um, because you, everyone sort of knew what was coming at that moment. But the pandemic really started somewhere between March 1 and March 15, depending on your definition. Um, well, you can see here the green, orange line here represents total margin. Uh, green line represents patient margin. You can see generally the orange total margin. This is the uh, average margin looking at uh, moving over time. All hospitals across the country over the past decade, pretty much solid there in that three to four percent. Not much trend up or down. We're seeing seasonality and it sort of you know looks like an EKG, so to speak, but really not much of a drift. Patient margin, probably a downward drift until about 2014, uh, jumps up a little bit there um, and sort of follows the trend from that point. Um, looking what happens during the pandemic. OK, so here's what we've been talking about. Patient margin, this green line, pay, people stayed away from the hospital. Uh, any um, uh, non-emergency cancels, uh, non-emergency surgeries were canceled. Uh, in April of that month, I was gardening and uh, really did a number on my foot. I should have gone and gotten probably five stitches, but did it at home because I didn't want to go to the emergency room. That's what ha was happening across the country. And so you see this green line representing the patient margin really uh, falling off at that at that point. The orange line, which represents total margin, these are margins that are uh, recognizing the care support and the federal support. So what's really interesting about looking at these two lines in parallel or in tandem is you can see the huge impact uh, from the green line, which is that patient business uh, losses the average hospital down at you know 9% loss. Uh, from patient business. The average, of course, means many were below that. But the orange line, we're seeing the highest average profits that we've seen in the whole decade. What's happened since then is a, a return to normal faster from the patient side. It's pretty much back where it was, and the, the orange total margin is trending back down as the CARES money um, uh, winds down, and it comes back down. So the key lesson here really is um, the overall what's happening for uh, the trend um, a little bit of a drift, perhaps, in the green lines in two different stories. They're pre-ACA implementation that probably shift up after that. Uh, but really, the last two years have been highly turbulent. We can overlay a national trend uh, for rural as well as this. So the thick line here represents rural hospitals, uh, both the same, same uh, setup, orange being total margin, green mean pay, uh, patient margin. And there's a couple of things we can look at there. And one of them is that for the most part, that distance between the two is relatively constant, gets closer sometimes, gets farther in others. But for the most part, rural basically follows the total trend, but is, but is below. With the exception that uh, during the CARES uh, period, during the pandemic, that total margin for rural aligned with the national. Uh, trend. So what that says, or one interpretation of that is, this is really the CARES money that we knew was targeted disproportionately to rural hospitals because we knew they were more vulnerable, and it did its job. 
it uh, it narrowed that, kept the rural hospitals solvent uh, during the pandemic. Let's look in more uh, about at Northeast hospitals now. So now we're comparing thick line rural north, Northeast, thin line rural national. Pretty similar uh, for the most part. And you know, if you look at the orange line, total margin similar throughout. For the most part, the average rural Northeast hospital looks like the average rural national hospital um, with a little bit of diverging total margin over the last year or so. Um, patient margin, uh, pretty much similar through about 2016 when the Northeast hospital starts to slip down and probably more so um, during the pandemic, about a 5% decline in net patient revenue. So in other words, total margin, pretty much the same rural Northeast versus national, a little bit of a, of a divergence here uh, over the last pandemic as uh, the rural Northeast hospitals saw less of an increase in total margin than the national trend. Patient margin, for the most part, pretty identical first part of the decade, maybe just slipping a little below over the last part of the of the tens um, with more of a divergence uh, recently. Now, why is that? Well, here's a chart that shows how net patient revenue in the Northeast compares to, in rural Northeast hospitals compares to net patient revenue in rural hospitals nationally. So these are all indexed so that 2019 is 100% or, or one. And you can see generally, as you look from 2011 to 2019, all four regions are seeing an upward trend, a secular increase in that patient revenue. No one really jumps out. Maybe the Midwest is growing a little bit slower because uh, it started from a higher level before it got to 2019. But for the most part, all the regions kind of look the same. Post-19, the red line here representing Northeast, while the other three had an average net patient revenue in 20 that was comparable to 19, what we saw in the Northeast is about a 5% decline. And that difference kind of persists in 2021. So in other words, rural hospitals in the Northeast region saw more of a decline um, from during the pandemic period than other parts of the country, and they've recovered more slowly. They're about a year behind in terms of the recovery uh, would be another way to think of it. So I mentioned why um, why CARES Act was so important for rural. Well, we know that um, for decades that rural hospitals generally have weaker finances than urban. There's lots of reasons behind that. Um, but one of the but in, to account for that, there was a design in the CARES money that recognized that and specifically had uh, additional resources through CARES uh, for rural hospitals. You can see here. Um, in um, in this in this chart that we've developed here and sources from uh, from a MacPac issue brief there um, that funding for CARES was about 11% of operating expense for rural hospitals and about half that about 5% for rural hospitals so the CARES money was very important um, for um, for rural hospitals. Here's another chart that um, gives you a similar conclusion of what we've talked about before. Uh, Green here represents total margin, orange is operating, blue is this patient margin that's very specific and um, green and orange would include the care support. So a couple things from this, you can see the difference from 19 to 2021 in the urban side is relative, I mean, four percentage points, I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call relatively small, but it's definitely smaller than the effect we saw in rural hospitals of a 2.2 to a three percentage point increase to a 5.6 percentage point increase um, up to 2021. Again, recognizing that the CARES Act was uh, very beneficial for rural hospital profitability. But again, behind that veneer, what's going on patient on the patient side, rural hospitals, the average rural hospital has been losing five, six percent on their patient business uh, since uh, 2016 and, and before, uh, whereas the average urban hospital is uh, profitable on the patient side. So rurals are starting from behind. Uh, we see the massive, uh, again, decline in 2020 uh, with recovery to 21, but you're still recovering to a loss. You know, thank goodness this year we only lost uh, six percent uh, margin on our on our patient care. So it's a very, um, you know, you're it's like the old Hershey bar aphorism where I lose a penny on each um, 
uh, Hershey's bar, but I make it up on volume. Rural hospitals are starting out, they are losing money with their core business and they have to do other things in order to remain solvent. And again, we're seeing that operating margin uh, floating around 0%. Um, again, just sort of uh, outlining the, and contrasting these two um, different stories, the rural versus the urban. All right, so where does that leave us? Um, so for uh, over 10 years, we've been tracking rural hospital closures. Uh, the bottom line here, bottom panel there shows the bar chart of closures. 2020, uh, there were 19, two and 21, three and 22. Um, I, don't, I guess I need to update this. I think we have been one in the last couple months. Um, but you could see really there's a very different uh, experience the last two years than it was in 2020. Is that it? Are we done? Rural hospital closures are over. We've we've weathered the storm. Uh, we've seen profitability like we haven't seen in a decade. It's all over. Thank goodness that's that's all done. No, absolutely not. Um, and just as I've shown you with the patient margin charts from before, uh, there's been a lot of effort to make sure that um, people understand that, yes, there's some uh, very high profitability being reported because of the uh, CARES money, but there's a lot of um, bad news behind that. And now that the CARES money has stopped and rural hospitals are returning to where they were pre-pandemic, um, where there's a lot of concern, and certainly on our, our side, that we're not going to just return to where we were, but uh, maybe that CARES money was actually keeping some afloat that otherwise would have closed and, and expecting to see a lot more closures nationally uh, over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. So I want to spend uh, a little bit last uh, few minutes talking about some current issues affecting rural hospital that are important for the, the landscape. I know Eric's going to go into, into these issues as more as well. Uh, but I'll just touch on, on them to a, uh, some extent here. Um, I mentioned that rural residents are increasingly receiving inpatient care from urban hospitals. So um, we can look at inpatient business overall, and it's you know flat to decreasing nationally, depending on how you look at it, whether you're adjusting for population or not. Uh, but what we do know is that um, that's not the experience in rural. Rural hospitals are unequivocally seeing less inpatient use. Uh, average acute daily census uh, fell 13% uh, over seven years uh, in the early part of the tens. Not much change in urban hospitals. Um, and this was largely driven by an increasing tendency of rural residents, Medicare uh, rural residents, to be admitted to urban hospitals. So we sometimes we call this bypass. Uh, the notion is that the rural resident doesn't go to their local rural hospital, they go to an urban one for whatever reason. Um, and what that does is it's decreasing the inpatient volume at the rural hospital. We know that volume is, is a key factor of, key predictor of uh, financial success in hospitals and rural in particular. And as that inpatient volume dries up, uh, it becomes more and more uh, challenging to be competitive and financially sustainable. So um, you, you may recognize this from, uh, depending on which generation you're in, this was a, a board game called Sorry. Uh, and the, the idea here was you would land on this, uh, if you landed on this uh, triangle, you would slide to the circle. And if your family member had a token on the bar, you kicked them off. And that's when you'd say sorry, and you could come back to start. Um, I'm including this as a, just as a reference here as we're starting from the triangle and sliding to the circle. And so that's how you want to think about uh, this sort of dumbbell plot would be another way to think of it as we start on one end and slide to the other. And that's that's the way to interpret this chart here. We're starting at the green dot, which was 2011, and then sliding to the 2019 dot. Um, so each of these uh, charts are showing the trend in the percent of revenue as um, that is of patient revenue that is represented in the outpatient side. And so you can see at the very top how important outpatient um, business is to the average rural hospital. Um, whereas now, um, you know, re, uh, we passed over half of hospitals, rural hospitals are getting 75% of their business uh, from the outpatient side. Um, gen, you know, a little bit of a trend regionally, um, certainly a trend in terms of uh, the kinds of hospital it is, but it's important to understand and recognize that we have this, this rural hospital is increasingly becoming an outpatient um, centered facility 
um, whereas the inpatient is a smaller and smaller portion of their book of business, again, on average. Um, looking at urban, on the other hand, about half of their business is coming from outpatient, the other half from inpatient. So it's a very different uh, business model between the two. Comparing Vermont to other uh, northeastern states, uh, Vermont's a little more outpatient oriented. Um, um, green bar here represents 2011, the blue is 2021. Um, it was you know, second to Massachusetts in 2011. It's right there tied with Maine in 2021. Um, so again, sort of consistent, maybe a little higher than, uh, than the rest of the region and, and nationally as well in terms of that. Uh, system affiliation or system systemization, maybe. Uh, hospitals are more likely to be part of a system, are increasingly becoming um, affiliated, um, and especially rural hospitals. This is a national trend. The black line here represents urban hospitals. 61% um, of total patient revenue in urban hospitals uh, was in a hospital as part of a system in 2011 that's gone up by 10 points in 21. Um, in rural is about 41% of rural hospital revenue was part of a system in 2011 and in 2021, that's 56%. So uh, gone up in both, still higher in urban, but rural seeing a faster increase. Um, and yet that's sort of the, you know, Vermont is the exception that proves the rule probably. Um, again, if we wanna wait by patient revenue, so we're not counting hospitals, we're looking at the percent of revenue, not only did Vermont uh, start as some of the most independent, um, they are currently by far the most independent of all the um, uh, rural, of all the states in the Northeast. So that is a um, one thing that makes Vermont um, a little bit more uncommon from its, uh, I guess, peers in the region. Is that good or bad? Well, um, again, you can sort of have, I'm an economist, so I always have to have three hands, right? On the other hand, and then there's a third opinion that there be to, to cover everything. But um, there's some evidence that mergers lead to better quality. So, um, you know, here is a study with all the citations uh, to the right, if you want to learn more. But AMI, AMI, uh, AMI mortality improved in hospitals post-merger. Uh, some uh, evidence of five-year improvements in mortality for heart failure, stroke, and pneumonia. So this sort of says mergers are good for quality. On the other hand, there might be excess problems. Uh, their merged hospitals were more likely to cut maternal and surgical services and less likely to increase their substance use. Uh, all three of these we know are really important in rural communities, often facing challenges. Um, um, this is often framed in the context of uh, independent hospitals. The decision is made locally um, about what services are needed in the community, whereas in a system, it might be made centrally. Um, so there might be more commitment to meeting the needs of the community in independent hospitals. Uh, it is interesting, though, that the merged hospitals were more likely to provide mental health. Um, so that, uh, that, that was an exception there where, where access was improved um, in hospitals that were part of a system. There was a, a pretty confusing paper um, that looked at um, do hospitals that become part of a system, are they more likely to close or less likely to close? And the way that I interpret this finding is that um, mergers can are often, you can sort of put them in two buckets. There is the rural hospital that's doing great and the large uh, urban center says, we wanna uh, you know, um, acquire these guys. They're doing great work. Uh, we're really proud to bring them into the system and we're really going to leverage that and uh, continue our service to the community, increase our footprint, blah, 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 blah. Then there's another group of, of hospitals that may merge because they're unstable, they're struggling to stay open and they're basically looking for someone to buy us in order to uh, keep us afloat. Um, and so what the authors of this study found was that um, the ones that were barely staying afloat, the ones that are financially weak, they were less likely to close after they merged, but the ones that were really uh, doing well pre-merger, they were more likely to close. So it's sort of the system, uh, becoming part of a system, becoming, um, you know, merging makes you uh, sort of mitigates or attenuates your, um, uh, your, your closure rates. So with all these trends in hand, um, Congress developed a new model, the Rural Emergency Hospital, 
this has been kicked around in different forms in Washington and across the country for uh, over a decade in various forms, if not longer. Um, and the basic idea, you know, here's some, uh, some details on it, but the big idea, if you're not familiar with this model, is it has to be an existing rural hospital with fewer than 50 beds. Uh, basically, the hospital has to close its inpatient wing. You can, do, you can offer observation beds, but no inpatient. Has to have a fully staffed ED 24 seven. Uh, other services are possible, uh, largely paid on a Medicare fee for service with a little bit of, of plus up from that. Uh, but the real um, difference here is uh, this almost $3 million additional facility payment, which is a, you might call it a grant, but it's a fixed fee, uh, um, an underwriting that, um, that Medicare provides to these rural emergency hospitals uh, to, um, to, to, uh, stay, to remain financially sustainable, or at least uh, to help with that. Because as they close their inpatient, obviously they're gonna see a, a huge decrease in their revenue. This AFP is meant to support and address um, that, that gap um, and, and keep, them a lot, um, keep them sustainable. So how important is this new model? Um, in, in theory, uh, REHs could start uh, 17 days ago. Uh, January 1, 2023. Um, there's probably been lackluster interest would probably be the way to describe it. Um, and a good friend Oscar on the left here says that, well, why is it not important? There's not enough for this additional facility payment. That's not enough to keep us going. Uh, in order for this facility to, to be a successful RAH, it need to be a big capital upfit and, and really redo the building. No one's paying for that would leave big gaps in service. Uh, if we did this, the OB would be gone. Um, would the community view it as a real emergency room? Um, and so how, what would be the, the, um, uh, the view of this in terms of a quality standpoint? And would this allow closures of otherwise healthy providers? There are some that are worried that um, this may be an excuse to, for systems, for example, to close a hospital that's doing fine convert them to this REH uh, when they really didn't need to. Elmo, on the other hand, uh, because he's overly optimistic or optimistic in the way he views things, he recognizes that some communities cannot support um, hospitals that, that have this inpatient and sometimes the volume is just not there. If you have you know, one person a night uh, in the uh, inpatient wing, that's really difficult to make that work on a, on a financial standpoint. Uh, might be closer to a frontier model, you stabilize and transfer, Certainly better than a complete closure. And if the hospital can't survive with what it's doing today, I'd rather have an REH than nothing. Uh, this AFP was double some early estimates, and maybe this is just the opening gambit. Um, there's some history here with, for example, critical access hospitals with Congress saying, all right, this is who we're gonna allow to be eligible, and then slowly kind of makes it larger and larger, makes it a little bit more um, of an attractive option. Maybe that's the case here. Um, and if the take up in RH is as low as some people are expecting, maybe Congress is gonna say, all right, let's try and uh, tweak this a little bit and make it a little more attractive um, uh, to meet the rural needs. If you wanna know more, um, there's a, uh, all kinds of reading available out here on this. We published uh, three of our most Four most recent briefs have been on the REH. Uh, you can get them there. Uh, and then the National Advisory Committee for Rural Health and Human Services put out a, a, a policy brief on REH, uh, I guess about eight months ago. Uh, well, four months ago. Geez, I can't count. Uh, but you know, just October 2021 there that, that covers that. And both of those are uh, available on, on Google everywhere. Um, if you want to find out more about rural health research and uh, the kinds of things that us and the other research centers that are funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy do, there's a great place to look for that. Uh, contact information here um, is my email address, um, uh, the website for our publications, and our Twitter handle. And um, uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. I can stop now. I will stop presenting and uh, happy to take any questions uh, uh, under your direction. Thank you very much, Professor Holmes. That was really interesting data, um, which I myself had not been aware of. So for process, um, what we'll do is we'll go through board member questions and comments, and then the healthcare advocate, and then we'll we'll turn to the next presentation and have Mr. Shell go, and we'll hold public comment until um, all the presentations are, are done. Um, so is there any board question or comments at this point?
I can hop up um, to the other professor homes. As soon as you said that, Owen, my my ears went up. <laughs> um, so, you know, thank you so much. Really, really helpful. I might have to snag the Oscar the Grouch and the Elmo, uh, you know, slide there. That's great. Uh, I'm just wondering, so much information here. Uh, as you think about rural bypass and this shift towards more outpatient care and even new technological developments like remote monitoring and hospital at home, how do we think about planning for future inpatient capacity needs in a state, a rural state, largely rural state that has declining populations in certain areas, but also aging populations in certain areas? How do we start to plan for what is appropriate inpatient capacity? Particularly, we just had a pandemic, right? So how do we think about all of that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I think uh, there's a couple of things to react to there. Um, certainly, we've seen, you know, as we're seeing this declining in patient, you know, demand, we're seeing that largely being seen mostly in the rural hospitals, consolidation of services in urban, uh, that, that makes um, uh, inpatient services in rural hospitals more challenging to, uh, to offer. Um, you know, certainly the, the math gets really tricky when you're having one to two people there per night, really hard to staff that and, and, and cover your, cover your costs. So, um, you know, having a, um, a purposeful view, um, and of course being aware of the circumstances in the community. So, um, you know, I know a little bit about Vermont. I'm going to draw instead more from North Carolina, uh, since I don't think um, uh, anyone here is going to know uh, as, as much here as they are about Vermont. Uh, but like recognizing, for example, the role of of weather and seasonality. And so um, I guess I'm not drunk from North Carolina, but well, in, you know, in, in the western North Carolina part where we have what we call mountains, um, uh, you know, that's certainly a different kind of context than what we have down east. Um, and understanding the uh, peaks and valleys, both uh, in terms of topography as well as seasonality um, and the role that that plays. Um, uh, and then I think also understanding um, cross-border patterns. And so uh, Vermont, of course, has lots, has many neighbors. Um, what is, how does that play out? Um, in many ways, I think being part of a, you know, North Carolina, which has become a very much a system-based uh, rural hospital state, um, has different challenges in the sense that um, a system can look at it and say, all right, we got two hospitals that are 10 miles apart. Uh, what we're going to do is consolidate, put one in the middle, um, and we can, you know, basically build from scratch and do something that's going to meet the needs of the community uh, better. That's harder when you have independence. Uh, because uh, that means a very different kind of approach. Um, but I think the, the truth is that, um, you know, rural communities across the country are facing this challenge, um, that we're, we're seeing these secular trends, um, you know, even though we've seen some, some population rebound over the, in the most recent data, I think that were out the last couple of days, um, you know, rural, rural communities continue to see declining population overall, um, and that's part of the uh, decrease with technology um, advances, as you've indicated, for example, hospital home, remote monitoring, there's less need for that. And so uh, looking at it and making the hard choice, what is it about, what is it we can do in this community? What what do we need? Um, and does it make sense to consolidate um, and rethink how we're delivering care here? Um, you know, there have been some places where they've um, had um, all the inpatient move to one uh, hospital and then the outpatient moves disproportionately to the other. And so it's more of a specialty uh, kind of thing. So rather than four people in each hospital at night, there's eight in this one, but all the outpatient stuff is done over here. Something like that, a, a little more of a of a system-based approach um, kind of thing. I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, um, you are. But... And it's actually, you know, it's really helpful and it's leading into a little bit of my next question, which is, you know, as we think about that, this central versus local decision making and envision a, a more affordable, financially sustainable hospital system, your your points are really well taken in terms of, you know, you've got population decline, there's fixed costs of delivering certain services that may not be met, um, you know, with those population declines. There's also 
the quality issue, right? As volumes decline, are the quality metrics being met with such low volumes? And so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what evidence do we start to look to to think about that distance versus uh, quality trade-off or that volume trade-off? You know, what services really do need to be essentially delivered locally at some distance? And what services could potentially be delivered at a farther distance, but uh, consolidated in such a way with a center of excellence, as you just described, where costs would be lower, quality would be higher? How do we look? What is the evidence that we start to look for to, to understand that distance to volume trade-off as we're thinking about a system here? The American Hospital Association, and I uh, didn't, uh, I remember just now that I intended to put this uh, table in the in the talk, and I'm kicking myself for that. But the American Hospital Association has a table of uh, of essential services that they think every community should have access to. Um, you know, I, I do want to um, underscore though that there's going to be a huge component of local awareness, and what I mean by that is, so for example. Uh, the demand for orthopedics near ski resorts is going to be very different than it is um, in eastern North Carolina, whereas the demand for, you know, uh, people with, with uh, diabetes care is going to be higher in our area. So really, um, you know, looking at the community need um, and um, understanding, um, uh, you know, what is it about our community that that is, um, what does our profile look like in terms of, of our health need? I mean, I think, I don't know which way I'm, which point I'm going to make here, but I'm going to start anyway. Um, what, one thing we learned from the pandemic was a, a, um, a relentless pursuit of margins, um, really keeps capacity, um, to, uh, margins that cannot sustain anything uh, that's extraordinary. Uh, and what I'm what I'm you know saying here, of course, is that you know rural ICUs were had very low capacity, uh, and as soon as we had a global pandemic, we saw quickly that those were those were filled. Um, and that's a decision that every system government has to sort of grapple with. Is um, you know it would be awesome if there was a pediatric anesthesiologist in every hospital across the country. Um, would that save lives? Yes. Can we afford that? Well, if we want to sacrifice other things. And so it comes down to, um, you know, how much are we willing to tolerate a little bit farther access? And when we talk about maternity, which is one we look at a lot, um, you know, this being an hour from an OB, we've seen this in Western North Carolina, if you're low risk, that probably is a, is you could probably manage that okay. But for high risk um, people who are delivering, being an hour from OB means you're not going in every week, uh, and so you're going to have inequitable um, uh, impact when you have to make those decisions about distribution. So, great. Well, thank you. I've I've taken up enough time. I'm going to pass it back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you very much, Dr. Holmes. Uh, any other board members have any questions or comments? Please go ahead, uh, Mr. Walsh. Thank you, um, and thank you, Mark, for joining us today, spending some time with us. Um, there's so much there, I want to spend some more time with it, but I also just want to ask a, a question or two about something that I didn't see, and that's um, the effect of this consolidation and the bypass effect that can occur with consolidation. Um, what your team has seen with the effect on prices for commercial payers. And how has has the consolidation that you've witnessed and the movement toward these rural emergency um, settings, what have you seen with the um, overall pricing, the prices that hospitals are charging and what people are having to pay? Uh, great question. That's not something we've looked at in terms of commercial prices. Um, you know, post merger or as consolidation, uh, um, people like Harold Miller have done a lot of a uh, fair amount of work in that. Uh, they've generally, found, you know, most of those findings have found that as systems consolidate, the commercial prices increase. Um, but I, I I can't speak any more than that, other than the, you know, I've I've read the summaries of the studies and uh, sometimes read them, but um, that's not something we've gotten into at all. 
No, I, I appreciate you, um, you saying that. So it's it's something that we would have to consider, right? That there's um, there are some, you pointed out nicely that there are some improvements in quality. The, in my understanding of that research, the it's kind of mixed, right? And, and it depends. And of course, we have to be conscientious of our geography and the local needs. I think we um, the caution that I take from this um, is that prices are likely to go up if we follow consolidating trends with consolidation. Um, so we really want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the local community, right? And and not trying to put in um, so, some cookie cutter approach that we've seen someplace else. But you pointed out nicely the. Um, area around a ski resort might be different than the lakeside community. And how do we understand what those community needs are and really spend some time grappling with that, really trying to understand our local needs so that we um, can make sure those are being addressed, right? Because some of this, the consolidation, it looks like there are some costs with it. It's not always a, um, the savings haven't, materialized the way that we thought economies of scale and care coordination would lead to savings. We just haven't seen those across the country. Um, and so being clear about how we're struggling with the trade-offs, I think is important. And I really am glad you're here with us to share what you've done in North Carolina. Thanks, Sam. I don't have any reaction to your uh, question. I think, I think you've, you've stated the trade-off very well. I'll, it, it comes down to exactly the tension that you've identified, so. Thank you. Oh, thanks, uh, Professor Holmes. This is a great presentation. Uh, I'm Dave Merman, I'm one of the other board members, uh, and I'm an emergency physician at a, uh, not a rural hospital, but a mid-sized hospital, but uh, definitely one of the things that um, I I would think professionally that I get nervous about is working at a hospital where you're just an independent DR with all without all the resources that I have available to me and and when you mention you know driving an hour for a high risk OB patient I'm thinking of a patient who's got you know difficulties accessing transportation you know uh, comes in an early labor I want a NICU bed I want a trans you know I need transportation I need an accepting facility so. To me, when I think of this stuff from a clinical standpoint, I think of, you know, this sort of elegant uh, coordination of various hospitals, resources, transportation, and all that infrastructure that needs to sort of grow simultaneously as, you know, hospitals reconfigure themselves to be, uh, you know, just these uh, freestanding emergency departments with an odds. You know, so I don't know if you have any reaction to that, sort of more of a comment that I'm thinking of than a question. Yeah, no, I, th I think, uh, thank you for that uh, comment, Dr. Merman. I think the way I would react to that is what you've really touched on is the equity concerns. And um, again, in North Carolina, I think I suspect it's probably similar in Vermont. You're never really too far from a mid-sized hospital. At least that's the state in North Carolina. There's, only, there's a couple places in the state where you can say, yeah, you're about 30, you know, you're more than 30 minutes from a hospital with 75 beds, for example, kind of thing. Um, of course, that works if, you have a job with sick time, you have a car that works, you have someone who can keep the kids when something happens, um, all those other um, sort of issues. And, you know, there are certainly, um, there's a large academic medical center that I'm familiar with, uh, which has a commitment to high risk uh, deliveries. And the way that that generally works is they have to be in front of the Dollar General at 6.30 in the morning, they get on the van, it takes them to the academic medical center and it brings them home at 4.30 p.m. Not super accessible if we want them to do that once a week. Um, so the additional context, you know, what does the transportation system look like? What does broadband look like? Um, you know, all those other uh, factors that really lead to uh, potential inequity, I think, also needs to be considered in this context. Yeah, I mean, in, in Vermont, there's large regions that are far more than 30 minutes from a hospital with more than 50 or 75 beds, and and I, I do think you really hit on this this equity issue and and um, thinking about the sort of the critical the critical access and the safety net and all of these terms that we use to describe rural hospitals. I think is really really important in thinking, you know, how if we were to ideally, you know, conceive of a system, what 
what resources they would have, maybe beyond what financially makes sense, but is ethical uh, from a from an equity standpoint. Um, a question I had for you is, um, do you have information uh, where you break down the payer type by rural hospital financial stability? Um, and kind of thinking on this idea of, you know, many rural hospitals, you know, seeing a preponderance of Medicare, Medicaid patients, probably less, you know, large employers, uh, less economic wealth. Is that information that you have in similar slide formats that we could see at some point? We have some. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure Eric, if I if I remember his slides, I think he's going to touch on it. I have some that I can um, find and share with you as well. That'd be, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Um, and then I guess the other question that you mentioned, a hospital home at home and, uh, oh, all the various um, new technologies to try to keep people out of the hospital. I, uh, from my clinical experience, I, 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 we don't have that really available here, but I try to think of when I see patients, would they be someone that would work for and and so often, uh, at least uh, in my region where patients often drive 20 to 45 minutes to get to the hospital, the, the, nailing that specific narrow subset is, is challenging. Do you have any, have you seen much uptake of this, uh, these technologies in rural hospitals at all? And, and if so, could you describe some of that? Um trying to think of some there's some that have been um um let's call this uh maternity based it was there's a program in georgia that was dealing with the loss of maternal and fetal medicine and brought in this is i don't think this is quite what you're asking but um telehealth to um like health departments with that were was driven out of Mercer, the uh, school of medicine, with largely a focus there, and so it it wasn't quite exactly that, but you know, embracing this idea that recognizes um, for something like high risk OB, I probably I probably need more than someone on a smartphone in their living room. I probably need to be someplace with you know, some uh, healthcare professionals uh, to support. So that would be that would be an example there, really leveraging um, telemonitor, in this case, telehealth. Um, and then there are other things like, um, just from personal experience, on, or, uh, I was on a, uh, involved in a trial for heart failure, uh, which, you know, with these telemonitoring daily scales kind of thing, identify trends before they require ED. So there's some promising in that kind of space. Um, but I think it really comes down to scale. It's hard to implement that for 10 patients. It really has to be done on a broader um, uh, where, where volume is going to make that uh, end up working better. Yeah, that makes sense to me too. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I, I believe you have a stop at 3 p.m., Professor Holm. So I'll, I'll just ask one real quick one. Just. In terms of the patient margin and the operating margin, um, can you give us a sense of some of the key contributors to operating margin that are not patient margin, you know, things like 340B and, and the others, because those seem particularly critical to the financial health of some of these rural, ho rural hospitals? Yeah, and these would be, um, a lot of it comes down to where the money is um, uh, recognized. So it might be things like, uh, cafeteria, gift shop, you know, those obviously aren't going to be a huge portion. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to think of other examples. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to put uh, my good friend Eric on the spot there. That's something I'm sure he can speak to uh, much better than I can. Okay, we can we can take it up later. Um, I wanted to turn it over. Robin, are you all set or did you have any questions? Nothing that's burning. So I'd say let's keep going. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to give the healthcare advocate time. Um, Please go ahead, Sam, if you have any questions or comments. Yeah, super brief one, hopefully. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Holmes, both Professor Holmes for the question and presentation. Um, I'm wondering if, I know you talked a bit about an increasing proportion of revenue coming from outpatient. I'm wondering if you feel like there is a ceiling for what percentage of revenue can come from outpatient or if there should be a ceiling. I'm just wondering if that trend continues to hold. Will we, have you seen cases where hospitals consider moving to a fully outpatient model? Because um, I think there's concerns that have already been raised around inpatient provision of services. 
Thanks. So there was a hospital uh, in North Carolina that publicly said, we don't want to admit any more people. Um, if, you know, if someone shows up and we have to admit them, we will. Uh, but for the most part, our inpatient wing is closed. And uh, they, I think they would admit like three people a year, basically. And so why do they still offer inpatient? Well, they needed it in order to um, have the payment benefits of being a, a hospital. They had to have an inpatient wing that was available to admit people. So the ceiling in that context is 100%, 99.97%, something like that. Um, at what point does it, I mean, this, this, I think this is sort of like what we think of as a hospital. Um, and there are plenty of hospitals in some states where their average daily census is less than, you know, they'll have like one night out of 10 with one person in a bed. Um, they're still hospitals. They're effectively just outpatient facilities. Well, this is, um, in this case, Hawaii, um, because basically, you know, it's the only inpatient site on the island and, um, or some, something like that. Um, so those are still technically hospitals in the way that we think about them, but for the most part, they you know, make all their decisions on an outpatient, um, recognizing that that's an, you know, essentially what they are and what they do. Thank you. Great, Professor Holmes, thank you very much for your time and your presentation. We really appreciate um, the broader context and view and information, so thank you. Um, and Thanks. with- Sorry, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation and uh, enjoyed speaking. Of course. Thank you. Um, and with that, we'll turn it to you, uh, Mr. Shell. Please go ahead. I, I believe you're, Mr. Shell, I believe you're still muted. How's that? How's that? That's good. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? OK, I had to go to a landline because of uh, my Internet was unstable, but now I've switched back. So I, I hope we're uh, dealing with some stability at this point. I'm going to I'm going to share my screen. Uh, just give me a second here to get the presentation up. <clears throat> and put it into presenter mode. How's that? Is that in the right mode for you all to see? Okay, great, great. Well, uh, thank, thanks, uh, Chairman Foster, uh, uh, and thanks for having me uh, present. Uh, as as m many of you recall, about a year and a half ago, I was asked to present um, kind of, you know, my thinking on Vermont, where we stand relative to national trends. Um, and before that, back in, gosh, it was either 2018, 2019, I was uh, I came to uh, Montpelier and presented um, to 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 a number of folks there on the future of rural health care. Um, so what I have is a you know unlike Professor Holmes, uh, he promised you 30 minutes. I can't get through this presentation in 30 minutes, but I'll make it as fun and lively as we can. Uh, it really looks at, at at where you know where and why we see the healthcare industry moving to. Um, and then talk about specific strategies for rural hospitals to be successful uh, from a national perspective. And then and then go back to and 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 look at how what you do or what you all are doing in Vermont is comparing to what you know kind of what we see in, in on national. Um, you know, kind of tipping my tipping my cards a little bit. I think Vermont is the leading state in the union on advancing towards um, you know kind of the 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 the, the Appropriate healthcare system of the future, and I'll I'll, I'll lead with that. Um, so, but with that, I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as possible. Um, I'm I'm not promising uh, 30 minutes though. <laughs> so. Uh, let's let's let let's move. So so I, I think the big message here is that that um, um, for the last um, you know essentially three years, as 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 we've been fighting in the in the provider uh, field, the the pandemic. Um, you know, and the shorting, uh, uh, staffing shortages, and you know, everything that's going on, the market is not slowing down. And and I've got some slides to talk a little bit about how I see some of what's happening in the market, and it's going to in future impacts on on our hospitals. Um, so the first one is 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 um, uh, the Kaiser Kaiser Family Foundation prints out the um, health insurance premiums, and if we look at the top line, um, health insurance. 
in the United States for a family of four in 2022 um, was was um, you know, 22, almost $22,500. A um, couple pieces that are relevant with that. First is that as we've become a third of the median household income. And 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 also you see that there's a stepwise increase in costs and 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 you know kind of is that expected to go away? I don't think so. So you know the outcome or, or, or what does this mean to rural providers is that as as you know any you know <laughs> economist would say as price goes up two things happen. Um, the first is that demand goes down. The second, that supply increases. And if we just focus in on the demand side, you know, you, as we become as health health insurance premiums have become a third of median household incomes, you would think demand to come down, go down. But but the good news is that that there's an artificial marketplace for health insurance through the, the through the exchanges and the premium subsidies by the government, so that demand stays constant. But on the supply side, again, as price goes up, new supply comes in to equalize supply and demand with price. The supply comes in. And, and what's relevant there is that coupled with this trend that we see, and, and you know, it's just a you know, this incredible acceleration of, of technology has enabled a whole new cadre of competition, this new supply coming into our healthcare system. And I've got a number of slides just to touch on that. And, and you, 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 you're well aware of all of them. Uh, Amazon. Um, Amazon has has jumped into this, and and um, they 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 acquired um, the, the one medical for for three point nine billion dollars. Um, they they've uh, launched um, um, they shut down Amazon Care. They did not feel that Amazon Care was transformational enough. Their Amazon Pharmacy has is is now created relationships with a number of Blue Cross Blue Shield plans. And then a couple of months ago they announced a a, a Amazon clinic, a, a direct to consumer uh, um, electronic platform for visits. So Amazon's jumping into this. Not to be outdone, Walmart, who considers Amazon its 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 fierce rival, uh, they've jumped into 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 the healthcare industry again. You know, as price goes up, supply increases, and here's more supply um, with freestanding health centers, direct to consumer uh, telehealth, uh, doctors on demand. Um, you know, you know, just just incredible expansion um, of, of Walmart into healthcare. Uh, we got Walgreens, and and um, uh, they 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 kind of jumped into this big with a 5.2 billion dollar investment in Village MD to roll out primary care practices across the country. Um, the, the the interesting comment that their CEO said, and it's down here on the, in this in where I'm, I'm circling, is that that. You know, Walgreens push into primary care aims to keep people healthy enough to avoid returning to the, and she said, healthcare system. I would I would change that and call it into the sick care system. So so ultimately, Walgreens wants to keep people out of hospitals, and 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 we need to be paying attention to this. Um, uh, CVS is another one that's jumping into this um, with their um, investments. You know, again, the growing their health hubs. They had 1,500 health hubs open by 2021. <clears throat> They've made investments in housing. They they create in 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 2023. They're they're creating a virtual care platform, um, and then more recently, um, they acquired. Um, for eight billion dollars, Signify Health, which which um, prior to this. In September, um, back in April, they uh, Signify Health acquired Caravan, who many of you know, uh, Lynn Barr's group that has created a whole bunch of rural ACOs. And then just um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, it was reported that CVS is talking to Oak Street Health, a um, private equity-backed um, um, primary care practice in the discussions there about ten billion dollars so well what we've got here is an incredible new market entrance coming in saying we have technology we are te technology based companies um, we believe that there's an incredible market play in in healthcare and we're going to be jumping in um, so so Big, big, big issues there. Um, the declining inpatient admission uh, volume. I mean, right? We live the healthcare system today. Um, you know, a majority of the payment is is fee for service, fee for sick care. 
a price times volume is equal to revenue. And in this case, what we have is, is you know, kind of uh, across the United States, we've seen a decline in this inpatient volume. So half of that equation of price times volume is net revenue. We've seen this decline going on. Uh, Vermont, you all <laughs> you all have, have written the books on, on going back even to 2010 where your 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 inpatient volume has been has maintained relatively stable. I was giving a presentation a week ago in Mississippi and the starting number back in 2010 was 136 discharges per thousand. So um, and they've come down to 114. Uh, so, um, but 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 for the most part, across the United States, we're having a decline in inpatient volume. Um, 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 back uh, in 2020, American Hospital Association reported that um, looking at outpatient encounters at hospitals for the first time in 35 years, there was a decline in outpatient services rendered in a hospital setting. Now it's interesting. This this uh, the third bullet down uh, the third bullet down here talks about the fact that it's not that it, outpatient care has actually gone down. It's just that it's being delivered in alternative uh, spaces such as urgent care or Walgreens, CVS, et cetera, as they come on board. So again, now now you've got this price times volume is net revenue, where in hospital settings, both inpatient and outpatient volume is starting to deteriorate. And then, and I'd like to show this because this uh, each each year in March, MedPAC comes out and releases um, hop profitability by margin. I know I, I know uh, Professor Holmes touched on some of this, um, th but um, you know it's interesting because going back to 2013, uh, the rural hospitals, both including and excluding critical access hospitals, were actually above you know positive Medicare margin. And then that deteriorated, and and it continued to deteriorate. If you look at all hospitals, you know, excluding the rural, their margin started at negative five percent, declined to around negative ten percent, and then increased. I look at the big reason for this decline that you see that I'm I'm pointing to with my arrow, is that. One, it was some of the volume reductions that we were talking about. The second is that that as part of the Affordable Care Act. Um, this was Obamacare passed in 2010. There was a provision that said, what we're going to do is we're going to look at inflation and we're going to pay you inflation less 0.75%. And we're going to do that. And we're going to pay that less 0.75% um, beginning in 2012. But that 0.75 started stacking. So on top of each other. Again, we live in this world of price times volume is net revenue. When price by your largest payer, i.e. Medicare, is going up at less than cost, you're going to get behind. That fee-for-service world that we're living in is starting to crumble. And then with some of the volume declines. And, and so that would be the reason why I see this um, decline. Now, this uptick was because of, you know, and what Dr. Holmes talked about was was some of the um, um, uh, uh, CARES Act funding, which, which was included. Um, so again, as the market, this is all during the pandemic. I just want to keep going back. All this is going on during the pandemic. Um, you know, we had Dr. Liz Fowler, who's the head of Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, um, she, she presented, uh, this was um, back in, in, in 2001, spring of 2001. She, she, she said a couple things um, um, at, this, at this conference. And it's interesting to see how those things are playing out now in regulatory, in regulation. So the first thing she said is we can't have fee-for-service remain a comfortable place to stay. Uh, the second thing she said is is regarding risk. She said we 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 can't have a one size fits all. We have to accommodate hospitals where they are, but we got to move the laggers into risk based models. So those two things. So if I'm the federal government and I want to, and I want to, my, you know, my biggest lever around making fee for service an uncomfortable place to stay is around reduce, you know, kind of bringing price down relative to cost. How does that play out? Well, this is the final rule that just came out in the summer of 2022 uh, related to payment for 2023. And, you know, the government heralded, heralded this as the largest increase in, in the history of the Medicare program, where from the inpatient side, they were going to, the, the, the payment rate was going to increase 4.3%. It's the 3.8 plus the 0.5%. Great. 
And the reason why they said we're only going to pay um, uh, 4.3 percent is because they said in 2023, we believe inflation is under control. Now, the challenge here, and again, you go back on Dr. Liz Fowler's comments, we're going to make fee for service uncomfortable. The challenge is, is that during 2022, the year that just passed, our costs went up between 8 and 12 percent across the board in hospitals. And the government's pay increase in 2022, finalized in the 2021 summer, was a, around a 3% increase. So we have this locked in cost higher than price that's going to be locked in indefinitely. And, and, and you know, you want to make fee for service uncomfortable? This is how you do it. Uh, the outpatient rule that came out was finalized in, in, in November. Um, showed a, a, a uh, I believe it was a 3% increase for, or 3.8% increase for 2023 relative to costs that we believe are going to go up higher than that. And then on the physician fee schedule, you know, after the inflate, or excuse me, after the um, omnibus um, bill was passed, is a net decrease of 2.5%. So again, you know, if you want to make fee for service uncomfortable and you have a lever, the government has the lever. Pay, give a pay increase less than what costs are going up. And then how do you make a how do you make the laggards you know kind of jump or be more interested in in alternative payment models? And this came out in the physician fee schedule rule that was finalized this year on November 1st, where the government said, hey, we're going to go back to 2014. And for rural hospitals without experience in accountable care organizations, we're going to provide significant incentives. We're going to give you $250,000 up front. And then for the first eight quarters of, of, of a five-year agreement period, we're going to advance you, essentially advance shared savings payments to fund your operations on your ACO. The second thing that they did is they said, we're going to have it so that you don't have to take on risk for up to seven years. And the third thing they did, it's not on this, is that they said that we are going to move towards administri administratively setting the benchmark um, tied most likely to some form of inflation rather than your own experience. All incredible um, opportunities for, for organizations to get into ACOs. And so again, you know, you know, from a national perspective, you know, the, the you know, kind, kind of what's what's the summary here is traditional fee for service payment is transitioning to value based payment. You all again, as I mentioned in my opening comments, in Vermont, you've written this book. Um, we're going to have to continue to pursue efficiencies. Clinical integration is going to be absolutely necessary. We'll talk about that, but inflexibility has to be ingrained. You know, we would have thought this thing would have rolled out much sooner than it has, but we're, there's the challenges are, 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 you know, kind of extraordinary in terms of how we're going to move this thing. So, so what's this new world look like? It's, it's an equation called patient value is quality over cost applied to a population. What we want to do is improve quality, reduce cost applied to a population, and the patient value goes up. I look at it as payment systems, and again, as, as, as what you guys are looking at here in Vermont, or you've moved to in Vermont, excuse me, um, I look at an accountable care as a payment system where providers monetize value derived from increasing quality, reducing cost applied to a population. And, and, and frankly, um, you know, there's, and let me say that again, accountable care as a payment system where providers benefit from efforts they take to improve quality or reduce cost, they benefit from it, and 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 it's you know, it takes all different types of forms, you know, bundled payments, um, value-based payment, self-insured health plans, ACOs, um, you know, all of these are forms where providers can monetize this value of increasing quality, reducing costs, and it's not managed care. This year. it's not managed care. It's not you know kind of going back to the 1990s. Um, the reason why the accountable care, I believe, is a payment system that is the future is that 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 the providers have the, the provider organizations that have the greatest opportunity to affect quality and cost have the incentives to do so. In managed care, the organizations that benefited from the providers increasing quality, reducing costs, it was the insurance companies. So I think this is a very different opportunity this time. The second thing is the government's all in. 
Um, new, we have new information systems to manage costs and quality. We have science that we can base medical decision making on. And frankly, going back is not an option. If if you didn't hear my first, you know, 10, 12 slides around these new market entrants coming in, they're not coming in to play games. They're coming into you know 19, you know, 19 and a half percent of the GDP um, into this industry to make money. And, and going back as an option, we've got to figure this out as our traditional providers. Um, you know, you know, I'd like to just touch on this slide real quickly, um, just, just because I think rural hospitals, you know, Vermont is full of rural providers. And, and um, um, you know, the, the point I want to make with this is that I think rural hospitals um, have significant value in this new world, um, in this new world of accountable care type payment mechanisms. And and it and it really came out of of um, you know back in 2011 when I remember reading the regulations on on the ACOs that came out of the Affordable Care Act, there was a comment that said um, a primary care physician can belong to one ACO, hospitals and specialists can belong to multiple ACOs, and and that struck me as wow there is there is the silver lining in here for the rural hospitals because rural hospitals are predominantly a primary care based delivery system. So how, what does that mean? If you think about it, if primary care physicians can belong to one ACO, hospitals and specialists can belong to multiple ACOs. If you think about it from you know kind of business 101, you can only attribute revenue to one source, right? Expenses you can cut up, you can slice and dice and spread around. What that was saying, that one kind of comment in the ACO regs was saying your primary care physicians with their patient attribution are your revenue centers of the new generation. Hospitals and specialists are bricks and mortar. And, and, and to some degree, when we start thinking about how we reward and hold accountable revenue centers versus um, expense or cost centers, you know, cost centers, you give a budget and you hold them to it. The revenue centers, you, you, you really try to encourage um, you know, activity that grows that volume. And so I think the rural hospitals that are primary care based have significant value in this new world. Uh, this is a really important um, um, slide and, um, and, and, a, and a concept because um, to some degree, it sets the stage for how important the change in payment in Vermont is um, right now. Um, I believe firmly in this premise that form follows function follows payment, that we organize ourselves around the functional imperatives of the payment system that exists. And, 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 and if you follow with me on that, and you know, it, you know, if you think about the functional imperatives of a fee for service payment system, right? Fee for sick care. It's it's you got to do three things and you can do those three things independently. First, you got to figure out how to offer more sick care services. Second, you got to figure out how to increase price for those services. And third, you have to learn how to manage expenses. And an organization on its own can do those three things to maximize the fee for service payment system. So to some degree, the form that falled out of the payment system of fee-for-service were independent organizations competing with others for market share. It's a market share play. When we start talking about moving to the payment systems that you all are looking to in Vermont, um, you know, a, a population or an accountable care where providers monetize the value of increasing quality, reducing cost, it's very different functional imperatives because the, now the payment is 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 um, it, it to some degree a a rural hospital or even a large hospital can't do that in in you know independently. So it takes um, aggregation of tertiary, rural, post acute care, public health, you know, diet, health and wellness. All of these become pieces of a health system to 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 you know kind of reduce the total cost of care by increasing health while maintaining access to sick care. The other thing it requires is aggregation to aggregate lives to diversify some of this insurance risk. And so the form likely to evolve out of this payment system that we're we're kind of facing, you know, down a barrel is 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 aligned organizations competing with other aligned organizations for covered lives based on quality and value. They're competing for to to offer their the patients in their systems the highest value. 
I think this slide right here sets up a whole lot of the rest of the conversation because payment does drive. And, and to some degree, I look at what's going on in Vermont and the, 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 the fee-for-service payment system that predominates, uh, you know, really the payment system, um, it, it has so, it, it created so much structural, um, 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 kind of structural setup that it's been tough to move away from it. So what does this payment system transition look like? And, and you know, obviously we've got the fee for service with no links to quality and value. And this was defined by CMMI several years ago. Um, you have fee for service with links to quality and value. Most organizations live in this world right here. You have this category three alternative payment models built on a fee for service architecture. And then finally, you have population based payment built on a population based architecture. Um, there's only one health system in the United States that's here at this point, and they are very successful. Thank you very much. And it's called Kaiser. And, and so, again, if payment sets the functional imperatives, which drives form, then let's understand what those functional imperatives are and the form as we evolve from these four payment models. My favorite slide, I, I know my marketing people hate me for posting this one, but it is the shaky bridge. Some of you in the, in, 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 in the Northeast, you call it the uh, boot and two canoes or something like that. Anyway, um, I look at this slide um, after a th this, this one picture show, you know, tells an entire story here around the challenges that we have. Um, over here, we have a very stable pillar on the left, right? You have a fee for service payment system. And it was a great pillar because the payment system and delivery system were completely aligned. The more secure you do, the better off you do financially. Complete alignment between the delivery and payment system until price starts going down relative to cost, until inpatient volume starts eroding uh, with pharmaceuticals, until you have new competition coming in like CVS and Walgreens and, and et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden there's this, this pillar starting to smolder. Over on the far right, the green, you have a you have a hundred percent aligned payment delivery system. The more healthcare you do, the less sick care you do, the more money you make, or at least you can stay, you know, stabilize yourself. Um, but to get here, is not for the faint of heart. And, and so I look at the four payment systems categorized by CMMI on the previous slide. The first one is right here, fee for service with, um, with no incentives for quality or utilization. The second one is right here, fee for service with, with quality and utilization incentives. The third payment, alternative payment models built on a fee for service architecture is right here. And I think where you all are in Vermont are kind of right here. Here, your feet are right above the crocodiles. And then your start, feet start to evolve away as we move to population-based payment on a population-based architecture. We can't just step from 2014 to 2034 because we don't have a healthcare system. We have a sick care system. It's gonna take time to develop. Uh, the other, th yeah, and, and, and so 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 here's the issue. If we're here in Vermont, we're kind of where I'm circling here. Your feet are above the crocodiles, right? The question is, do you go back or do you go forward? And I'll put that out there because here's the challenge. If you go forward, it's going to get uglier before it gets better. And you're seeing that in some of your margins that uh, you know across the state of Vermont. Uh, it's it's gotten uglier because you guys have advanced. Do you turn around and go back? I would say that this pillar doesn't exist anymore. And so it's going to take the bold soul to be able to take this step forward so that we can advance on. And the question is, what do we have to do to stay a short of time here so that we can get to beyond here? So again, pretty tacky slide, but there's a whole lot going on there that we have to understand. Several years ago, we came up with a, 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 a kind of a, a, um, a framework for how hospitals should think about this transition. Let me explain it briefly, and then we're going to kind of move, um, you know, we'll finish up the national and then go to Vermont specific. Um, so here's, the, you know, again, if payment dictates form and function, then let's set payment as a driver of organizational planning. Uh, fee for service. This is that first column. Phase one. This is fee for service with incentives for quality and utilization. 
This is phase two. This is feet right above the crocodiles. Alternative payment models built on a fee-for-service architecture. And this is where you start to lift your feet above the crocodiles, where we're moving towards alternative payment models built on, uh, you know, kind of that alternative payment model infrastructure. Um, to think about this correctly, we got to transform a cup. We got to transform our delivery system, our sick care system. We have to create a healthcare system, and that's the blue bar in the middle. And we have to transform payment. Because we're primarily in phase one of payment right now, there are essentially seven things that organizations should think about doing um, and, and keep them all in lockstep because you don't wanna to create too much health in your community if you're still getting paid predominantly fee for service. You create too much health in your community and you're still getting paid fee for service, you're in trouble. So we've gotta keep these areas timed. So some of these, um, you know, kind of, and, and the, the one last thing I will explain is that the orange bar is the strike point. So when an initiative, you know, initiative one hits the strike point, we gotta do it. So the first is we got to improve operating efficiencies, quality, patient engagement. We got to do this. We've lost 138 hospitals that haven't figured this out yet. Um, we got to align with primary care as the revenue centers of the new world. So we better plan today. So when the payment system gets to phase two, we're aligning with primary care. Um, I would say that when hospitals close in these first two phases of payment, they haven't either done this well in phase one, or they haven't come together with their primary care physicians. These are market-based closing. These are not planned. As the payment system evolves, the next is service error rationalization, coming together to take out big chunks of fixed costs. When we were working with the four hospitals in Northern New Hampshire, the discussion was, okay, we have four hospitals in a two county area. Do we need four hospitals? Can we transition one to urgent care? Uh, it, 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 nothing happened, but at least those were discussions because uh, once you have a payment system not paying uh, and providing incentives for sick care, you can have planned approaches to fix cost reductions. So transforming sick care around creating health care. Just think about that as crawl, walk, run, sprint. And then we got to pick up and move payment because if we don't and we create health care. So today, you know, the areas that we have opportunities for fee for service, quality utilization, implementation, self-funded health plans, trans transitional payment models in phase two. So plan today for the ACOs, low risk models, and then full risk. So in the end, what we believe is that in order is payment drives as we drive payment as our function our functional imperatives change, and as our form changes, we've got to make sure that we're checking the boxes in phase one of payment of all of these. As payment system evolves to phase two, we check all the boxes here, um, and then et cetera. In the end, we believe sick care, health care, and payment under one umbrella is the large provider-based health plans that we're starting to see emerge all around the United States. So national strategy, how to think about that. Several years ago, I was on a trip to Hawaii and I was asked to present um, out in Hawaii. And I said, wait a minute, everything is based on payment and, and shame on us for that. Shouldn't we base payment to pay for the form around maximize the functional imperatives of a planned healthcare system, right? What does that mean? What is the vision? What, happens, what did we say for 2030? What happens if we said, what happens if we wanted um, you know, the, the Vermont health systems partner with their communities to improve health, truly health, while preserving access to high quality sick care that we've always had. Let's flip that plan. Let's start with the end in mind and then figure out how to pay for it. And, and so, okay, let's, what's the functional imperatives that we want? What is it that we truly want? And, and, and you know, essentially it's here. We want health systems partnering to improve the health of a defined population. It's those social determinants of health. It's that health equity, chronic disease, disease management, and increased relevance of our health systems in healthcare. Not just there for the sick care as a backstop to be more proactive around health, while at the same time maintaining access to high quality sick care. Isn't that the function that we truly want? And what are the, what are the requirements? It's common vision for healthcare of Vermont which you all have, payment systems that provide incentives. All right, what does the form look like? Well, in my belief, it, it has to be high level of integration. Um, we have to be able to make decisions on, on, um, 
um, you know, kind of, well, one we have to, we talked about earlier, we have to aggregate all the different players from, from tertiary to rural, to primary care physicians, to specialists, to public health, uh, wellness, diet, all of this becomes part of this aligned provider group. We have new roles for health systems that the insurance function and the health systems come closer together. The uh, integration of payment and delivery system, um, the, the the requirements, patient lives to diversify and central, uh, centralized decision to make appropriate right size delivery system, and then common information technology platform, all in the format. Okay, if we know what the function is, if we know how that's going to look from form, how do we pay for the darn thing? And and I think the first thing is that, is it that the payment um, must fund necessary access to health care while pre preserving traditional patient care. We cannot have a disincentive for creating health in our communities, which the fee for sick care system that we have now does. Um, so fee payment incentives cannot preclude health interventions. Payment systems cannot preclude, at, preclude access to appropriate patient care, sick care. But we have to be able to reflect income for both health care and sick care on the, on the financial statements of our health systems. So what are the requirements here? Well, you know, again, if health systems of the, if the hospitals of the future, the bricks and mortar, um, are, are the cost centers, then, you know, maybe a global budget payment to providers based on attributed population. Financial reporting methods to adopt new payment methodology, credit on income statement for improved health, and, and new cost centers um, provided budgets to manage within, as we just talked about. How do we see this as short-term imperatives? Proactive approach to determine vision for Vermont healthcare. Now, again, remember, I this presentation, this part of the presentation came out before I was involved in Vermont. I changed it from Hawaii to Vermont just to reflect, you know, to be you guys. But, but you know, to some degree, you're doing this. The statewide initiative is led by your governor's office and 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 through these uh, the agency, um, healthcare providers to accumulate scale and centralized decision making. Um, care management, organizing framework, PHOs, aligned medical staff, um, and then partnerships with commercial insurers to pilot these pay payment programs. To some degree, you guys are moving in this direction in Vermont. And so, again, all national stuff. Now, let's drill this down to what you're doing. And and I want to touch on this stuff briefly because you know you, you know more than I do that you know all of the great things that that are going on in Vermont, starting with the blueprint of health. You you started this back in 2003. Did anybody think it was going to be so difficult that 20 years later we're still trying to figure out how to advance this? But the the patient center medical homes, the the CHTs, the hub and spoke medical assistant treatment, all are great things under the blueprint. The Green Mountain Care Board, I think it's a great op, a great organization. It is exactly right for what you're trying to advance here. Um, you know, the addition was the Act, Act 167 that was just passed uh, uh, last year um, um, around uh, hospital sustainability. Um, the all-payer um, ACO model, and um, I, I think the... Um, the, the, this this payment model, which was a five-year program from 2018 to 2022, with you're in the extension year now, and then you have an optional year, I, I would hate to see you guys give this up because um, I, I, I think it's an incredible vehicle to transition payment and, again, changing the, fu the, the functional imperatives and then the form. Uh, the One Care Vermont. I love the fact that you have a a one state Vermont in which uh, you know all 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 providers are participating in it, and um, um, you know I, I didn't reflect some of the recent news that just came out a couple weeks ago um, um, around Blue Cross pulling out, but I'm 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 hoping that's just a temporary. I I don't know. I'm not sure, but. Um, but um, you know, for the most part, you have a majority of payment coming into one vehicle that can then define payment structure. So the insurance companies can continue to compete on the attributes of insurance function, but having a consolidated payment system, which we can move payment in the state. Uh, regarding the providers, you have 14 hospitals consisting of, of an academic medical center, five PPS hospitals, and eight critical access hospitals. Uh, if we look at the margins, we had declining margin. I think Mark Mark talked a little bit about this um, a little while ago, uh, with the uptick here being some of the CARES Act funding. 
But definitely, you know, these margins going down. Unfortunately, what Mark um, doesn't have or Professor Holmes doesn't have is the 2022 information. And, you know, as I'm traveling around the country right now and, and visiting rural hospitals, uh, the, the wheels flew off in 2022 um, with, the, with our cost increases of 10, 12 percent and our payment increases of only 3 percent. Um, primary care, a mix of employed and private practices, some operating as FQHCs and RHCs, really good stuff here. Um, majority employed by health systems. Again, that's that integration and alignment. Um, um, and, and, and nearly all practices participating in patient-centered medical homes. You know, I, I'm traveling to some parts of the country where I bring up the concept of patient-centered medical homes and people don't know what it is. You guys in Vermont are incredibly advanced in these areas. Around payment, um, you know, you got two predominantly uh, payers in, in um, um, AVP or MVP, excuse me, MVP and um, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, you know, lots of different, um, 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 you, you, know, you know, good stuff there. Uh, the self-funded health plan represents a significant portion of insurance as well. Um, the uh, Medicare, 46% uh, of inpatient um, hospital payment, 29% of hospital outpatient payment. And, and again, um, you know, with the um, um, participating in the, the, um, uh, the Medicare um, uh, pay payment uh, ACO model and uh, running the claims through the, the, um, the Vermont, uh, One Care Vermont, you know, I, I think real great opportunity to, to, to advance. Uh, Medicaid, much smaller. You guys have gone to a total cost of care um, with a, a risk quarter, um, moving payment along nicely. And, and so again, you know, all of the things that you're doing are, are, are exactly spot on. And, 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 but we are where we are right now. Um, as I've traveled the, 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 you know, over the country the last, um, you know, kind of last couple of years, a little bit less during the pandemic, um, I've, I've learned some things that I think may have some interesting value as it relates to how Vermont thinks about the future. First of all, I never would have thought it would have been taken so long. Again, you guys came out with these concepts in 2003. Um, but the transition to population-based payment is going to be evolutionary, not revolutionary. revolutionary. Um, and that is because there are so many strings that are pulling provider organizations back to fee-for-service. And we haven't figured out how to clip those strings so that folks can advance. There is no risk-free payment system. And I want to really emphasize that. Fee-for-service, when you're getting a 3% increase from Medicare and your costs are going up 10%, that is not a fee, that is not a, a risk-free payment system. And so, but it's the payment system that we know. And so, you know, it's it's you know, but but at this point, there's no risk-free payments anymore. Uh, a next concept I think is really important is we like to talk about risk in, from the insurance function risk. And, and, and I like to change that and think about that as the residual claim on health. That if we can, that, that you know, insurance risk, if we are able to create enough health in our community to reduce the sick care costs, that becomes the residual claim on health. And I would really like us to start thinking about how we create health to, to reduce costs. Um, uh, benefits provided to one payer are reaped by other payers. Um, you, you know, you guys have a pretty sophisticated payment system with Medicaid and, and that you move to, you know, to some degree a form of capitation for the hospitals. Um, benefits uh, that, that are provided to that payer are reaped by other payers. And, and uh, all, all should, you know, in other words, we should get as many providers involved in the same payment system. This, this concept, the more I think about it, the more it is critical to understanding why we're stuck. And it's the 80-20 fixed variable cost understanding is critical. What we're talking about here is that, and I would say in rural, it's probably 90-10. But the true cost of delivering care, we talk about, we talk about like that, you know, we spend what 90% or 85% of costs of care in the last six months of a person's life. Right. I mean, you hear these numbers out there. Well, it's because it's measured in claims. 
The problem with claims is there's a significant portion of fixed costs included in claims costs. When we're talking about the true variable costs of this last six lives, uh, the six months of a person's life, true variable costs are pennies on the dollar. And, and I would say if we go with this 80-20 rule that, that um, um, as long as we don't have 80% of payment in Vermont or in any state in the union in some type of um, like a fixed payment arrangement, global budget or something like that, there will always be incentives to drive up sick care utilization because the contribution margin on one more unit of service sick care service is 80 cents on the dollar. And so in order to buck that trend, we're going to have to get 80% of payment into one form of payment model away from fee for sick care. And the last is that this full payment transition to population-based payment will take years, but when complete will fundamentally align provider organizations incentives with the greater population's interests. Um, that, that the provider organizations will be about as much about, you know, the backstop of providing high quality sick care with, with the, the proactive approach to improving health in our communities. But it's going to take years for some of these reasons. And I would think that this 80-20 and, and even greater 90-10 for rural hospitals, this is an important dynamic to understand. Some of the observations I have specific to Vermont, so those were, you know, kind of more natural is, Again, you. I think you are the leader in sick care. I talk about you wherever I go, um, because of, of 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 all of the great things that 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 you've got going on. Um, you've got buy-in from the highest level of state. Um, you've got a payment system aggregator, which I think is absolutely critical. And I'm not sure if any other states are going to be able to have what you have the ability to use and leverage. Uh, the comprehensive payment system reform well underway. However, challenges. Some of the challenges, you you know, rural hospitals, um, you know, we want to hold them responsible as risk-bearing entities. But if they only receive 30% of the total claims dollars in payment, and they're responsible for taking on risk for the entire 100%, it's tough for them to accept risk. Uh, I think some of the challenges, the commercial plans, 50-50 um, gain share with no downside risk. Um, there's not enough, you know, kind of uh, of a stick there to have them not focused on growing that sick care and that contribution margin from incremental sick care. Um, and that's what this point is right here. Um, a majority of providers, um, the, the fee-for-service payment exceeds 20% of total payment, thus providing incentives for payer sick care volume. That's that 80-20 fixed cost variable cost that we talked about. Uh, the... Um, and then, and then some of the other uh, challenges is the optional health system and independent provider enrollment and alternative payment models based on programs that the hospitals can choose what programs they want um, to be participating in. And if, if fee for service makes sense to drive up contribution margin and profit, um, they're going to stay away from 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 kind of advancing the payment systems in those directions. So some of the considerations, and I proposed these to you a year and a half ago. I would say they all remain exactly in place uh, 18 months later. Um, highest level of state to participate. And, and I think you guys are doing that. I think we target 2030 for full transformation, which gives time to move, you know, to kind of create the infrastructure to move away from sick care as so singularly focus and invest in healthcare related activities. Uh, it's gonna take time. I mean, physician contracts, you just you just think about the simple fact that physician contracts right now, generally there's productivity incentives in them. And the more sick care you do, the more surgeries that you do as a surgeon, the better you get paid. And, and it's gonna take time to ha to, 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 to um, kind of make this, trans this, this transformation. But if we set a specific goal, if 2030 is the goal and we back into it, what are the things that we have to do to make that happen? Um, one Care Vermont, I think absolutely is critical um, to aggregate nearly all payment, at least 80% of payment, which is then the channel to providers. Um, health systems required to participate in all programs, um, primary care practices required to participate in the CPR, um, transition nearly all health system of payment away from claims payment reconciliation towards budget, uh, total cost of care shavings risk for, for all payers, um, and then, uh, you know, One Care Vermont 
a statewide vehicle for payment change must have broader governance representation. And and I and I and I'll and I'll say that broader governance representation involves you know health insurance representation, maybe um, you know state, you know may, maybe you know politicians in the state, the governor, you know somewhere. But this because it is such an incredible vehicle to aggregate payment, having it just be under the arms of the hospital, I I don't think is going to be enough of what of. of I don't think it's going to be a vehicle for change um, unless we have this broader governance representation. And then the Green Mountain Care Board to actively participate in setting the total cost of care budget. Um, you know, all of these things are important observations. But in conclusions, um, you know, really the fee for service payment system is designed for sick care, precludes incentives or payment for meaningful investment in health care. Um, Currently, the function of healthcare is dictated by finance, as the fee-for-service payment system was designed to pay for episodes of sick care. Um, if the healthcare system starts with the optimal function, um, it would require both sick care and healthcare. Um, I think a global budget payment is a way to move in that direction, rewarding cost centers of the future um, with, with efficient use of resources. Um, I think a shared savings incentive provides incentives to invest in true health care. Um, and then with some tweaks, you already have so much of the necessary infrastructure to become a true health care system. Uh, it, 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 it's really going to take tweaks rather than, you know, some states. And I was in Mississippi uh, two weeks ago. Miss <laughs> They, they're so far behind, um, you know, where you guys are. Um, you guys have an opportunity here, and so um, I'm I'm really excited to 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 see what you've done and the the opportunity that is in front of you to advance this. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my presentation. I probably took too long, but there was a lot of stuff we had to get out there. So thank you. Let me figure out how to turn this off. I think I think you succeeded um, and you, your timing was perfectly fine. Thank you very much for all that information, Mr. Shell. You, you're not seeing my screen anymore, correct? OK, good. No. Nope. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to board member question and comment. I am not hearing uh, chairman. Chairman, I'm not hearing you. Oh, hang on. Susan, can you hear me OK? I can hear you. OK, there we go. You got me, Eric? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, no, 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 no worries. Um, well, thank you for your presentation, and I'll I'll open it up to the board members for any questions or comments that they may have. Chair Foster, could I go ahead? Please, of course. Thank you, uh, thank you, Eric. A uh, lot of information there. I wanted to ask just a couple questions about some material early in your presentation. Yeah. The um. Walgreens, CVS, Amazon. Um, in your experience, are those greater threats to independent healthcare provider offices or hospital systems? Each of them talk about getting people healthy enough to keep them to keep patients or people out of hospitals. Mm -hmm. To some degree, that's their goal. Is essentially, if you think about it, if there's if if we're 19% of the GDP, they're trying to take their share of it. It's got to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So one point is this direct attack on creating patients, you know, improving the health of communities to stay out of hospitals. Which, as long as we're fee for service revenue, that's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. The second threat I have, you would think, is that they. What you're seeing is the the Wall Street backed organizations investment in primary care over the last 24 months is almost astonishing. You know, you got Oak Street, you know, the word on the street, ten billion dollars. You got Village MD going out for five point two billion dollars. You got, you know, and so if you think about it, you know, as the demand for primary care goes up by Wall Street backed companies, the price is going to have to go up, which is going to hit our health systems in Vermont in the in the hip pocket. In in that's how I see a couple different considerations. So both volume and cost. Thank you. It it, um, it seems to me, and I want to explore this more fully, <clears throat> that those organizations 
by seek to improve access to primary care services and therefore could be more of a threat to independent providers. Um, and that would increase pressure on independent providers to consolidate. And the consolidation, although we're, we expect improved care coordination, um, economies of scale, things like that, th those haven't materialized as much as we've seen increased prices due to the consolidation. And so I just, I, I, I wanna, I appreciate you coming in and, and talking with us, but I wanna try to think through that more fully. And as a board, we, we regulate hospitals. We don't regulate the independent practices. So it's, it's um, some tricky stuff, but thanks for coming in and sharing your experiences with us. Yeah, thanks. Um, Eric, I'll go ahead real quick. I had a similar question, and I guess it's how do you see, um, and I know this is a bit of a crystal ball question, but how do you see some of the new market entrants um, into healthcare interacting with some of these payment reform mechanisms? For instance, if you're talking about global budgets, but then we have some, I guess we'll call it a disruptor um, with huge financial incentives, how does that interplay work out? And how do we think about that as we negotiate new arrangements with CMMI? For example, if you're saying that a huge amount of the primary care is gonna to go to Walmart or whoever, and we're setting a hospital budget and we're paying people based on the health of their population, but we have this outside party coming in, how does that work in your, in your vision? Yeah, that that one is that one is a tough one. I you know, I you know, one of the first things I think about is is you know, for years we've attributed uh, you know, we we determine revenue based on attributed lives to primary care, right? We the total cost of care budgets attributed through lives. And 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 if the lives now are being assigned to, you know, Walgreens, <laughs> you know, um, our hospitals are going to left, be left on the outside. And so to some degree with Vermont, it may have to be more of a community attribution of the hospital portion of the total cost of care to determine budgets rather than, um, you know, you know, direct primary care. It, uh, that's, a, that's a really good uh, question, Chairman. Um, okay. Yeah, this well, is all new. I mean, you know, again, this is all, you know, in the last, you know, 24 months has been the big in, influx of all of this activity. <clears throat> okay, that be, was, yeah. That was my only real burning question. Um, and I'll turn it over to the other board members if they have anything else. I'll just jump in. Um, on that particular issue that you just raised, Owen, I think you know one of the issues for us in looking at our primary care landscape now is that we have uh, much of our primary care is connected to the hospital, a higher percentage than a lot of other states, and then another big chunk in federally qualified health centers, and then of course a smaller chunk in independents. So, um, and sort of back to Tom's. Point two, to me, it seems like the new market entrance, there's multiple potential disruptions for us at the hospital level, the independent level, the FQHC level, depending on whether that, I don't think we've really seen those market entrants yet. Um, so I think that's still something, although, you know, we have started to see a little bit of the venture capital driven brought, you know, Medicare only ACO business start to come in. So I'm not saying we're immune from it at all, but I think sort of given the landscape of our system, there could be multiple ways and it and implications. Yeah, one, um, one of the but, things that, that I I just think um is that that you know in terms of our practices, we've got to be much more retail based and, and more uh consumer consumer oriented. Um, you know these these technology-based companies want to transform the patient experience. Um, the reason why Amazon shut down Amazon Care is they said it's not transformational enough. 
Um, and then, and then, then they went out and, and, and to acquire primary care practices. I mean, so I, I think what I've been telling people when I'm visiting rural hospitals is we've got to, you know, expand our office hours within our clinics. We have to have open access. If a patient's not feeling well, they got to be able to see today. Um, these are things that are, you know, kind of basic antes into the game going forward. Just, just one question um, from me. I think one of your slides mentioned the need for 100% uh, global payments and the shifting of insurance risk to providers. And I'm thinking about again your your diagram, which I think is very effective, you know, around the the, the bridge. And I'm thinking about that with respect to reserves, actually, in this case. So how do we think about reserves? Who holds them, and how much? In the sense that right now we've got insurance companies holding reserves, right, to mitigate unexpected. Uh, medical expenses, providers aren't holding any reserves in a fee-for-service world. So as they take on more risk, they're going to need to reserve more. Um, insurance companies are going to need to reserve less. Hospitals may try and seek uh, commercial rate increases to cover that new risk, when in fact the system already has some reserves held it in insurance companies and risk-based capital reserves that they already have. So I'm thinking about as you're thinking about that bridge with respect to moving from fee-for-service to value-based payment, I'm wondering what you think about the funding of reserves, shifting of reserves, duplicating reserves, all of that as we're as we're moving to that new model. Well, I, I you know, my thinking and again, we probably all have thoughts around this is that the insurance and provider functions have to come closer together to align incentives. I don't think that, you know, insurance companies should be giving up their insurance functions, but they should be coming together, you know, with you know, and maybe maybe what coming together is 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 the comment that I made, uh, the consideration around expanding governance on One Care Vermont, so that that the insurance company sits at the place of of the um, you know cash distribution system to the hospitals, where we have that function, we bring together that function. Um, I, I I think it's going to be important to maintain reserves in the system. And I think that system is a coming together of the two functions. How we define that is specifically, I'm not sure. I mean, and there's there's a lot of really, really smart people on this call that, that would probably could sit down in, 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 in an hour and figure that out. But it ultimately, it's it's the it, we've we've got you know the the provider organizations that have the greatest ability to affect quality and cost have to be able to be on the hook for that residual claim on health, i.e. we call it risk today and fee for service, but it's that residual claim on health. It, they have the greatest ability to affect that now in partnership with the insurance companies who have the claims and all of that. Again, you coming together in those functions, it's a more meaningful opportunity to affect, you know, kind of health. And so they, I, I really, I really, I, I hope I'm not putting myself in, in trouble here within the state, probably am, but um, it's just that coming together. Thank you. So uh, I, thanks so much for the presentation. It's very interesting. Like uh, everyone else, I agree with just the, a lot of information, a lot to think about. Um, <laughs> So I work as an emergency physician. So I am one of sort of the big funnels into the sick care system. And I just had some reflections that I wanted to share with you and then maybe a few questions afterwards, which is that one is that I think that when you look at the low admission rates in Vermont and that stabilization of low admission rates, it, it's been a very interesting experience for me for the last decade working here when I worked in Massachusetts prior. And it's not a kid, here we have conversations with our patients trying to convince them to stay in the hospital when they really need to stay in the hospital. Where in Massachusetts, I was trying to convince patients, no, they were really okay to go home, <laughs> um, but they wanted to stay in the hospital. And everybody, I mean, it's so many stories of people who have pets and dairy cows to milk. And, you know, can I come back in the morning for my for my further cardiac evaluation and we have an aging population. So I I do I do wonder if we're in a different position than a lot of other states. If if we're already at our nadir of of sort of what our admission rate can be 
And actually now we're aging and, and we may have people that are living longer, um, but maybe needing more intermittent sick care. Um, I don't know, I guess, I guess just start with that. If, if you have, you know, if that sort of is something that you've thought about or, or what your thoughts are on that. Well, again, you know, if we remove fee for service as the payment system, right? Just, just, just forget about it. And we think about the true costs of caring for that patient, whether they admit it into the hospital or not. You, eighty to ninety percent of your costs are already spent before that a patient is admitted to the admitted or not to the hospital. So, so you admit this one patient that you know. I want to go home. No, you have to stay. What did your costs just change in your hospital? Not much. It, it was a little complicated, right? You know, lately because we're so we're completely at capacity, um, yeah. and so what the costs that are changing now, in the, lately in the hospital, is hiring more traveling nurses to to staff those beds, which are really, really, really expensive. Um, I do think too that. Part of and, I, and I'm I'm struggling with this concept a little bit as as I try to understand it better is the idea that you know inherently um, me as a provider who works in a I mean I'm in a mixed fee for service I don't really understand the system of the pa patients of I mean when I'm working clinically I don't know how my patient what their payer status is I'm blinded to that information I never oh, ask <laughs> that's emergency medicine and. Um, what I do know, though, is that I often have patients that are, are sick enough to come into the hospital. They can't manage at home. They can't walk. They can't take care of themselves. They need nursing care. Family isn't available to do it. Maybe they have nursing care needs themselves. Um, elderly couples living in rural locations, just getting by, crossover threshold, not getting by. In our system now, the complexity is in a fee-for-service system that I see is that we don't have a admittable, billable diagnosis. And, and yes, we do, we work very hard to get these patients to stay in the hospital, but it's this complicated, you know, billing milieu. And, and I'm trying to understand that, you know, in this idea that, you know, inherently as a provider, the hope when you move to global payments is people like me, are, the assumption is that I am motivated to do work out of payment, which I don't, I don't see that among myself or my colleagues and the system that I work in. So I'm trying to understand, um, I think there's a long lead time that we have before we get to the point where we're gonna see the healthcare system as opposed to the sick care system. And that we're, we're gonna have a long time before we really start reaping the financial benefit as a society. I hope we re reap the health benefit as a society as soon as possible. Um, I, it's an observation. It's something that I'm trying to understand. I, again, if you have reflections on that, I'd appreciate that. Well, <laughs> I I do want to see the health. You know, is, so so a couple things. One is that right now, for the most part, the payment system literally is a disincentive for wanting to improve the health of your population, your community, your patient, anybody. Now you may take it upon yourself. Hey, um, you know, there's, there's, you, you're smoking, you got to stop smoking or there's, you know, there's obesity issues. You got to address those. Um, I mean, you're going to do that because out of the, of who you are, but the system has no financial incentives to do that. I want to see the payment system, and, and because of that, we're we're 20% of the social determinants of health, right? The total cost of healthcare. I want to see us get paid. I want to see us have that residual claim on health that gives us an interest in really creating community health. You know, diet. I mean, you know, medical schools don't teach diet. Um, you know, they, you know, my daughter, uh, you know, you know, had me read a book called How Not to Die. I don't know if everyone's ever any read that book, um, but but an incredible book around, you know, how diet is 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 uh, has a significant impact on the health of a, of, of a population. I just think that if we got paid um, for you know, if, if we did not, if the payment system did not preclude incentives for health care, could we take our 20 percent social determinant of total health cost of health care? 
it from a provider's and increase it to 25% or 26% or 20%. At that point, we could make a meaningful difference. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but it's I, I feel that very passionately and it, and it addresses some of what you were sharing. I think, I mean, I had another question for you, but I don't know if it's, we have the time to even, <laughs> maybe this is a second separate conversation is, <laughs> is how do we build a health, a health care system? And, and, and I guess my, my question on that is what is appropriate to attribute to the current health delivery system? And what is it appropriate to use other social systems to use that for, for delivery of health and wellness? I mean, uh, we, we had a meeting with one care, you know, and what could you do best to deliver, improve health of Vermonters and what are some of the things and sidewalks come up? And I, and I agree with that. Like, I agree that there's infrastructure, yeah. you know, um, trying to alleviate poverty, trying to deal with nutrition, uh, pediatric obesity, I think is a thing that we just really need to think as a society about how we're going to try to help m mitigate the long-term consequences. But anyways, I, I guess the well, one I mean, last, yeah, go, oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, just a quick response to that. I mean, I, I look at, you know, Kaiser, right? Kaiser's revenue is premium dollar. And then they make resource allocation decisions around improving health and and sick and, and maintaining access to sick care. Uh, they're successful when their hospital beds are empty. That's what their CEO will say. Um, they just spent you know millions in housing, right? I mean, so um, uh, I think CVS Health just put some big million dollar number into housing. CVS is is Aetna, right? And and so it. I, I th you, you asked the question, how do we start creating this health system? And, and, and my answer is, get, let's fix the payment system. And then the answers will emerge. Um, I, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, I'm just, uh, I'll go off on tangent here. I was, I was in a meeting um, in Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania is rolling out the global budgets for, you know, up to 30 hospitals across the state. I think they're at 18 now. And, and the meeting, uh, it was a meeting with all the hospitals that were participating in the global budget. And one of my good friends, he's a emergency room physician similar to you, um, also in the School of Public Health for Iowa. He led a discussion around, um, you know, with all the CEOs in the room saying, OK, if we if the payment, if your payment system was fixed, what would you do to improve health? That room for an hour boiled over with all of the things that these people could be doing to infect, you know, disease management, um, diabetes management and ideas after ideas after ideas. And it was an incredible discussion. And but it it pref the preface was the payment system was changed, and and um, you know to me how do we fix that? That is the number one rope that's pulling people back, and it has to do with that darn fixed variable cost incentive. That until we can get eighty percent of payment into some type of alternative payment model, we're going to have incentives to drive up the contribution margin from sick care services. Oh boy. I get excited about this stuff. <laughs> it's appreciated. So <laughs> great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, and with that, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comments they may have. Nothing from me. Appreciate it, Chair Fossil. Great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chell, thank you very much for your time and your thorough presentation and for, for coming in today. Um, and hopefully we'll hear from you again soon someday. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. I'll, I'll right. sign off because I gave a meeting to run, right? Yeah, you can stick around <laughs> if you'd like. You can go, whatever you prefer. So, but okay. thank you. I appreciate you guys. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Um, and with that, we'll turn it over to Sarah Kinsler, our Director of Health Systems Policy, to discuss um, an update to our Act 167 work. Ms. Kinsler. Thank you um, so much, Chair Foster, and apologies for the delay while I get my um, various screens situated. Uh, can you all see my slides? Um, noting that the meeting is running long today, I will, um, I'll strive to keep it brief and snappy. My slides are, um, my graphics are less interesting than either of our uh, two panelists who we've just had who were excellent. So um, hopefully that will be okay. Um, all right, so um, 
Uh, for the record, Sarah Kinsler, Director of Health Systems Policy at the board. Um, I'm here to provide an update on GMCV's work on Act 167, Sections 1 and 2, um, which shares a lot of themes with the presentations that uh, you just heard and, and will allow me to, to tell you a little bit about what we are doing to kind of um, address the issues that our two speakers today brought up. Um, so a little bit of background on this work and how we got here. And I think um, Eric Schell alluded to this a little bit uh, in, in his presentation. Um, but we've been building on, we've been building towards this for quite a few years now, both in the work uh, of GMCB and in the legislature. Um, so in 2019, um, the, the legislature um, tasked GMCB with convening a Rural Health Services Task Force, which was chaired by Member Lunge. Uh, the purpose was to evaluate the current state of rural health care in Vermont and to identify ways to sustain the system and ensure that it provides access to affordable, high-quality health care services. Um, there were 14 members designated in statute. They met throughout the second half of 2019 and produced a report with some recommendations, which um, are kind of still, many of those themes are still the themes that we're following today. Um, that same year, uh, the board required a subset of hospitals to develop sustainability plans due to persistently low and declining margins, and also the news that Springfield Hospital uh, would enter bankruptcy, um, which was, um, you know, kind of a, a jarring, um, you know, wake up call to many in the state, I think. Um, in 2020, uh, that requirement to develop sustainability plans expanded uh, to, all to all hospitals uh, following the COVID public health emergency, uh, and in part, uh, building on the Rural Health Services Task Force work, uh, the legislature passed Act 159, which resulted in two major reports, um, the Hospital Sustainability Report and the um, options for uh, regulating provider reimbursement report, which I don't want to fail to mention because it kind of sets a regulatory framework for this. Um, and because it was extremely lengthy and I and I wrote it. So we should we should all probably um, go reference that report all the time. Uh, in 2021, there was lots of work uh, on that uh, hospital sustainability report, which was submitted in early 2022. Uh, and building out of that, the legislature um, had had many kind of robust conversations uh, with the board, with uh, the Agency for, of Human Services, with providers, and out of this grew Act 167, uh, which I will update you on today. Um, Act 167 provided the board uh, with $4.1 million in dedicated funding um, for the activities that uh, I list here. Uh, these activities are the Section 1 and 2 activities. Section 3 is the funding. So um, today I'll be walking us through uh, Section 1, which includes the development of a proposal uh, for a subsequent all-pair model agreement led by AHS. Uh, we are in collaboration. Um, the development of value-based payments for hospitals uh, to include a global payment model um, and or value-based payments for ACOs uh, led by GMCB in collaboration with the agency. Um, alignment of GMCB regulatory processes with value-based payment models uh, and a recommended methodology for determining allowable growth rates for hospitals, uh, which is the board's work. And finally, leading a community engagement process to drive hospital system transformation. Um, so we will talk about each of those um, at greater length um, momentarily. Um, so now leading us into section one, um, we'll start with the all-pair model. Um, current all-pair model agreement um, uh, would have ended in 2022 had we not uh, just embarked on an extension period, as Eric Schell had mentioned. Um, the current agreement represents really close collaboration between uh, GMCB and AHS. GMCB takes point on data and operations related tasks like reporting results to our federal partners, while AHS is really the policy and strategic lead, particularly as we think toward development and negotiation of a potential future federal state model uh, with our partners at the Federal Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which I am bound to slip up and refer to as CMMI shortly. Um, this past summer and fall, um, AHS convened a healthcare reform work group uh, of key stakeholders to discuss um, both you know, potential future federal state models and other issues. Um, GMCB was a uh, participant and planning partner uh, in all of those discussions specifically related to the all pair model um, and actively collaborated on things like meeting planning and agenda and materials development uh, as well as in meeting discussions. Um, as I 
alluded to just now in December, um, an extension to the all payer model agreement was signed by Governor Scott, AHS Secretary Samuelson, and Chair Foster. Um, this extends the agreement for potentially two years, a one year extension, so that'll be 2023, plus another year at the state's option, which would be 2024, um, which could provide a bridge to a subsequent federal state model if Vermont chooses to participate. Um, and again, those are conversations that uh, the agency is leading with our, our federal partners. Um, AHS has just submitted a report on this topic, which I wanted to call out here. Uh, and we can also provide a link to anyone who's interested. So moving on to uh, payment model development, um, the statutory language is included here. And you'll see that while um, there uh, is some openness in the language regarding um, you know, what kinds of payment model or models will develop, global payments are one of the models we are required to focus on. Um, another area where we're having close collaboration with the Agency of Human Services. Um, and, and since we're kind of co-convening these work groups, I wanted to make sure that folks had um, information on kind of how those have evolved. So previous slide, I had mentioned AHS's healthcare reform work group. Um, this included a global budget subgroup to help inform uh, the federal thinking on this issue, particularly regarding areas where Vermont hopes to retain flexibility to design and implement um, something Vermont specific in you know, a future federal state payment model um, for, for the Medicare program in Vermont. So um, starting next week, we'll be continuing this work and really building on this work um, by bringing together a, a technical work group, um, a technical advisory group um, called the Global Bud Hospital Global Budgets Technical Advisory Group um, uh, to really dig into the technical details of a payment methodology, a, a hospital global payment methodology. Um, GMCB and AHS will be co-chairing uh, this technical advisory group um, and, and very kind of focused on the details. Um, on this page, I, I wanted to provide a little bit more information about the group's makeup and the contractors that will support us, um, but suffice to say, um, this requires significant contractor expertise, um, both kind of number crunching expertise, which we're getting from mathematical policy research, uh, and um, uh, policy expertise and kind of policy options, um, which uh, Bailiff Health is supporting us in. Um, those are two contractors with significant expertise, um, both in global budget models, healthcare payment models, uh, and in Vermont, they're contractors who have worked with us before and are very familiar with our efforts. Um, and so they they will work with staff to kind of help guide us uh, through this decision making. Um, I've included some of the membership, and as you can see, again, really focused on technical expertise. Um, I did include a link to a web page that does not currently have any materials on it because I'm unable to post them today, unfortunately. Um, but there will be materials public publicly posted from this group uh, at this link, so stay tuned for that. Um, on, on this slide, I wanted to provide just kind of a sense of the things we'll be talking about in this work group, um, because we're, we are going to be really kind of digging into the data. Um, so those are listed at a high level here, but you'll kind of see, you know, defining the scope, figuring out how to calculate a baseline budget, defining what budget adjustments should look like um, for, you know, um, unpredictable or exogenous factors for, um, you know, shifts in, uh, utilization um, adjustments based on performance in, in a variety of ways, um, how how and which payers or providers uh, would participate, strategies to support care transformation. So we'll be kind of working through all of these issues um, one by one uh, with this group over the course of, uh, you know, January through um, really December of 2023, the full calendar year. Um, so the next work stream uh, has a few different parts. Uh, this is really about evolving the board's regulatory processes to kind of match new payment models uh, and, and kind of reflect, reflect new payment models. Um, but the legislature also has tasked us with recommending a methodology for determining allowable growth for hospital budgets and last considering the, the appropriate role for, of global budgets uh, for Vermont hospitals. Um, this work is led by Sarah Lindbergh on our team, uh, and I know that Sarah reviewed the plan for, for this work at last week's board meeting, so I'll be um, particularly brief here. And you'll have you'll notice that you've seen uh, some version of a number of these slides um, just a week ago. So um, initially, uh, this kind of regulatory transformation work is really focused on our hospital budget oversight. Um, this was this work was ongoing before Act 167, and we have um, a dedicated contract with Mathematica to support it. Um, so again, good synergy um, between the the contractors on these work streams. 
Um, I've included Sarah's slide here with some of the questions that that team is asking as they pursue this work, which I just think um, shows kind of how we're thinking about this process and how we're and how we're considering um, how to evolve our regulatory efforts, which um, in, you know to kind of reflect reflect the current reality. Um, this slide's also familiar, uh, just showing the timeline of this work. And I think the key thing is that major changes to the regulatory processes will come in FY25. So the hospital budget review process that we'll be undertaking in summer of 2024. Um, looking ahead, I mentioned earlier, there's kind of some other sub work streams here. Um, and those are things that we'll be taking on following kind of the re regulatory evolution uh, on the hospital budget process. Um, it may be that as payment models um, are developed and kind of the contours of future federal state models become clearer, uh, we'll also be looking at other regulatory processes uh, that might need to adapt, particularly I'm thinking our kind of ACO regulatory processes uh, and all payer model related regulatory decisions that the board makes around the, the Medicare ACO benchmark spending target. Um, but a lot of that is still TBD. Um, so moving into Act 167, Section 2, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, community uh, engagement process, last but not least, certainly. Um, so Section 2 of Act 167 defines a community engagement process for hospital system transformation, focusing on reducing inefficiency, lowering cost, improving outcomes, reducing health inequities, uh, increasing access, and maintaining, maintaining infrastructure for emergency management. Um, so we're currently wrapping up the process of getting a contractor on board for the scope of work, and I'll describe the actual scope uh, a bit more in a few slides. Um, the contractor will do uh, quantitative and qualitative data collection, as well as funding allowing, providing intensive technical assistance to hospitals to help them develop transformation plans. Um, and we expect this work uh, to include a, a really broad swath of stakeholders, including hospitals and providers, payers, state you know state agencies and departments uh, and Vermonters at large as well. Um, so uh, this slide kind of gives you the overview and the timeline. Um, over the spring and summer, the board uh, board staff and leadership worked very closely with AHS to develop an RFP scope uh, and to vet it with stakeholders. Um, this is very unique in state contracting, not something I've ever done before, but we thought it was really critical uh, in this scope of work to make sure that we had input and buy-in and kind of our, our scope was well vetted from the very beginning. Um, we wanted to make sure that the scope that we procure for is the right scope. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the key tasks, but just wanted to say that the key date here is contract execution, which we expect in March or April. Um, we're hoping to uh, notify a successful bidder um, you know, by the end of this month um, so that we can get moving on contracting because we, uh, we also think it is very critical that the work start as soon as possible. Um, so diving more deeply into each task. Um, task one is really about statewide and community specific analyses and data profiles um, uh, and making sure that we're utilizing existing analyses as much as possible. Um, so that's a kind of qualitative, sorry, excuse me, quantitative data collection. Um, task two is qualitative uh, data collection. Um, engagement in every HSA. So um, this likely likely looks like um, one or a series, one or more, um, you know, public meetings or town halls uh, in each hospital service area to make sure that we we kind of have a touch point in every community. Um, it will both include qualitative data collection, but also sharing out um, the data that we compile or analyze in the first task, so that communities have a better understanding of the local landscape, both now and what's projected. Um, and task three um, is really about asking, so now, what now? Um, now that hospitals and communities have the information that we've collected through tasks one and two, where can they go? How can the state help? Um, in this task, uh, to the extent that funding allows, the contractor will be providing more intensive technical assistance uh, for transformation uh, and facilitating also uh, a group learning collaborative so that participating hospitals can learn from one another. Um, we're anticipating that this would include a small handful of hospitals. I think we estimated four in the RFP, which would participate voluntarily. Um, I do want to note that funding for direct technical assistance to hospitals was not included in the final Act 167 budget. So this is something um, that we really want to do with the current budget, uh, if at all possible, because we really believe in the importance of this work uh, and in making sure that hospitals have the resource to develop solid plans for the future. Um, and finally, um, 
this is kind of a timeline for this work once the contract is executed. Um, you'll see here that uh, the data analysis and broad community engagement tasks are really focused in the first six months of the two-year contract. Um, so that work will need to get underway um, really, really quickly and kind of be super well planned out. Um, the goal here is to get the technical assistance started as soon as possible and again, budget allowing um, so that hospitals can have expert support and technical assistance as they work to develop those transformation plans. Um, and that is all from me, Chair Foster. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Kinsler. Um, any board member questions or comments? Great. Um, I have none either. I've been fairly um, very involved in this work, so I appreciate the update. It's very well done. Um, the, does the healthcare advocate have any questions or comments? No, just thank you, Sarah, for all the work on this and appreciate the opportunity to work together. And at this time, I will open it to uh, public comment on any of the topics that we discussed today. Mr. Carpenter, how are you? Please go ahead. Thanks, Owen. I have a lot of background noise, so I hope you can hear me. Um, just, just, just fine. Great, thanks. Yeah, I'm in the cafeteria of the State House, and there's a party going on. Here I am at the board meeting. What kind of an idiot is that? Anyway, thanks to Dave for his comments on the emergency room versus, <clears throat> you know, the health care versus the sick day, uh, sick care. That was good. Um, I always thought that a healthcare system was to take care of the sick, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, and as someone who has been through the system, almost died from our system of private insurance, and the idea presented by Eric and by some of the others that the patient is essentially a consumer, that the patient is someone who is financing a whole business and industry is kind of grotesque. And I'll leave it at that so the noise won't drive you. You know, <clears throat> we are not consumers. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, good to see you, and I hope you get to enjoy some of the party yourself. Um, <clears throat> Probably not. <laughs> Come on down and enjoy it for me. <laughs> they got ice cream? Yeah, they do, actually. <laughs> right. Vermont, ironically, it's the Vermont Medical Society. Oh, I'm a, ethical you rules. Stay may, right away. <laughs> ethical rules may prohibit my consumption. Um, well, nice to hear from you, and thank you for your comment. Um, any other questions from the or comment from the public? I see that our numbers of attendees has dwindled dramatically, and I thought perhaps Professor Holmes wanted to take attendance to make sure her students remained through the entirety of today's meeting. I'll have to take a screenshot for you. Um, all right. Um, at this point, is there any uh, old business to come before the board? Any new business? And is there a motion to adjourn? I move we Down adjourn. Line. Second. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.